Hello and welcome everyone to Noman Art Jam. Uh, super excited to have an awesome special guest with us today. Uh, in case you've never been to a Noman Art Jam before, we're kind of having a new format for this year. So we are basically uh, having some guest artists on who are showing us their process and we're going to get a walk through that. I'll try to follow along, but also if I have questions or if you guys have questions in the chat, please feel free to ask along. Uh, before I get into that, we do uh, have some housekeeping to get out of the way. This special event is sponsored by Lenovo uh, with NVIDIA. So so please, uh, thanks to Lenovo for being able to host or sponsor these events. Uh, we were only able to make these events happen because thanks to their sponsorship. So we really, really appreciate that. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to add Jay Hill to the uh, stream right now. Jay, hello. How are you doing? Hello. I'm doing well, man. How are you? Awesome. Thanks for, thanks for the invite. No worries. Yeah, we already got a bunch of people in the chat. I see greetings from India, Brazil, and Turkey. So we got an international audience saying hello. Um, Jay, I wanted to kind of give you a quick uh, moment to kind of introduce yourself, show off a little bit about your portfolio, and talk to us a little bit about who you are. Okay, cool. Yeah, so uh, my name is Jason Hill, or Jay Hill, and I'm a character artist in the game industry. I've been doing that for something around 10 years or so now. And uh, I also just, you know, make art and characters and stuff in my free time. So uh, with this is my portfolio right here. And you can see uh, my latest uh, professional characters were from Apex Legends. I'm working at Turtle Rock Studios right now on the game Back mm -hmm. for Blood. And uh, this is kind of a good example of something that we're probably going to be trying to do today. It's a, a shorter kind of study. Mm -hmm. um, and then these other projects, you know, take various lengths. But this is the kind of stuff that I do. And this is, these characters are from Evolve from several years ago. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this is uh, the kind of stuff that I do. And how uh, long have, uh, how long have you been working in the game industry? Yeah. It's like 10 years or something like that. Oh, it is. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I'm not very good at keeping track, but yeah, it's like 10 years. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty um, good. I mean, what, what do, where did you go to school? How did you, how did you learn this stuff? Uh, so I went to the Art Institute of Orange County. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I exactly learned, you know, everything there, but it was an important uh, thing. Like I get asked sometimes whether or not going to school is the right thing to do. Sure. And I don't think my answer would be the same today. Mm -hmm. uh, online is so great for learning all kinds of stuff. And I still, you know, learn stuff online. I try to learn as much as I can all the time. But it was a really cool experience in that I met other like-minded people. And again, it might be the time, you know, and the place. You could sure. probably do something a little bit similar today online. But it was great to meet people. And um, I still have those connections today. Like I, I worked with people, you know, right now that I went to school with. There's people that – there's people like in my graduating class or a year in front or behind that are like at Naughty Dog and Riot and Blizzard. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, there was just – it was just a really cool time where like ZBrush came out while I was in – college yeah. it's weird when i think back to it because uh i guess because i was young but i you know i wanted to model characters i guess you know it seemed like a cool thing to do and uh it's so weird thinking back that i made that huge life decision um you know before normal maps and before zbrush <laughs> and stuff like what was i yeah. doing i don't know what i was doing yeah i was doing uh, it by poly modeling yeah and uh yeah. yeah i mean i loved quake i loved counter-strike uh, so I guess that's the kind of characters I thought I was. I think back then I didn't really think too much about the future. I just thought it would be cool, so I did it. But, but yeah. So that was uh that was school. And then even at school, actually, um, I watched a lot of Nolan DVDs. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they had a library there, and you could rent, you could take home at least three DVDs. So mm -hmm. uh, I watched all kinds, and that's what was cool about those DVDs at the time. They were just the most premium oh, tutorials. Totally. And then also. Um, like I could get it on uh, cinematic modeling characters in Maya. And then also yeah. I could do like clay sculpting from a mm -hmm. clay sculptor in the industry, like the mm -hmm. movie industry, which I'm, I've always been interested in. I, tr I actually take a lot of inspiration and ideas from that, from like practical makeup and effects people uh, and the way they did props and stuff. So the movie mm -hmm. effects has been a, a huge influence on me. And that's probably the impetus of why I even started doing this was uh, movies translates. like Jurassic Park. Like the, yeah. the traditional clay translates to digital clay, especially if you do it with your hands, if you play with it and it's all form, like it's understanding of form. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, we have like, you know, 
the benefit of symmetry and all the magic stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> and yeah, undo. So it's like, yeah. yeah, it's like sculpting with superpowers, really. Yeah, absolutely. Right on. So today we're going to be doing a head study, you said, and you, you kind of had some yeah. reference we were you were looking at pre-stream. So let's yeah. kind of talk through what we're going to be making and talk me through your reference process. So you're doing a head study. What are you looking for? Yeah, cool. So this is um, my Pinterest. This is where I've been saving my reference for years. So I just pulled it up to show you what it would look like. Um, so I just got these different categories and I just collect reference anytime I see a cool image. So uh, for doing a head study right now, I, I also have hands and hair reference and all kinds of stuff that I'm interested in. But this is the kind of stuff. So I just save things that I like for whatever reason. And then so today what we'd be doing is this study, what I think of it is, is a single session project, something that mm -hmm. we can, you know, rush through. And it's more about the creation process, the, um, and trying to learn at the end of it. We don't really know exactly what we're going to learn, but we're going to, we're going to try to choose something that seems cool. Um, maybe if it is, it's applicable to a bigger project, I'll do that. But I look for something that has life in it. Uh, and you see, I save a lot of, you know, uh, images that are like that. I also mm -hmm. like different lighting and colors, just different things. But I like to, I like to try and make things feel alive, even in my studies. You know, when you're, when you do professional work, uh, it's imperative that you do things in a default pose. Um, so for fun and, uh, and doing like personal work, I like to try and make things, um, you know, have a little bit more life. You can see I'll have expressions a little bit Mm -hmm. Um, but that's the idea is that when I do studies too, we can go really extreme because then we might learn some stuff. We have more stuff going on with, so this is, uh, oops, this is, um, one that here, actually I'll show you right here. Yeah. So this is one that I'm thinking about. I might do right now, maybe this. Oh, those are super this. extreme. Those are great. Yeah. So I'm thinking something crazy would be fun today. Mm -hmm. And you can see like you get all the cool stuff going on with the wrinkles. Uh, you get the compression. And it's just more out there, you know, it's more of a challenge. And I just think it's more exciting and, and more interesting than doing a default pose. True. So yeah, that's what I would try to do. Um, we're gonna stick mostly with Dynamesh. We might have to use the remesher when mm -hmm. it makes sense. But the idea is to focus on the like sculpting process, you know, trying to use our eye to measure a little bit. In production, I'm not against tracing, you know, I'll straight up trace stuff, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Production is all about, you know, making things at a high level as accurately as possible. So we'll have more time, we'll have more tools. So this is more about an exercise. And that's why I think it's important to choose a subject that's interesting to you too, mm -hmm. so that it's at least a little bit fun. And then if you come up with something that's good, then you have something that's, you know, more, more of an interesting image. Cause that's, that's ultimately what this will become most likely is a single image, sure. you know, even though it's a 3d model. Yeah. So we're just going to focus on, on that sculpting. Perfect. So how do you start? What's your, you got your reference. Are, are you doing this guy? Or are you doing uh, one of the other yeah, ones? Yeah, I'll probably, uh, let's see. I'll do, uh, yeah, I'll do this guy. Why not? All right. I'll do I'm going to end up finding mine on my own side. Cool. So let's see what all, I, 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 have, uh, I have this book and I don't think, I think it's at my work, but it's the book of Watchmen portraits. I don't know if you've ever seen that book. Yes, that's a great book. I love that book. And so I'm Googling some re reference from that. See if, what Sick. I can find. Yeah, that's an epic book. It might be one of the coolest things about that movie, actually. It's cool that that happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're going to start with this head um, model today. Um, that's in the that's comes with ZBrush in a project. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways you could do it. You could start from a sphere. That would be like kind of the max difficulty. Mm -hmm. And then you could start with a base mesh that has topology. Mm -hmm. And that would be, you know, you'd be more like posing it, more like a, a facial expression or blend shape that you'd be doing mm -hmm. in a studio. But this seemed like a good in between so that we could just get up and running. I'm just gonna dynamish the crap out of it. Sure. And then uh, we're just gonna start pushing and pulling it into the right shape. All right. Yeah. So do you use any fancy settings? I'm sure we'll get some questions about this, but uh, fancy settings for dynamesh numbers, does that matter to you or is it more just what it kind of is looking like? Yeah, so I kind of, I guess I just kind of did that. I just turn everything off. Um, I don't know why polish and blur are on by default, but I just turn everything off mm -hmm. and I'm making it really low so we can use it right now. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so cool. I think this still might be a little bit high. Mm -hmm. So the principle, actually, it's all right. 
The principle is going to be to stay as low as possible for as long as possible. In Dynamesh. Yeah. Got it. Uh, why Why is that your principle? Why is that what you follow? Uh, well, it's, it's limiting, which is good. Um, everyone has a inclination to go too high, too fast. So it's a physical limitation. Um, so that you actually can't get into the weeds. Mm. And also, um, another way of thinking about topology and density in ZBrush or in 3D is like the more polygons is the more resistance you're creating. So like an example I often give is if you sculpt in clay, a common technique is to use um, a, an upside down aerosol can that will freeze the clay mm -hmm. and then some some flames that will... Uh, heat the clay and melt it and sculptors do that to change the density and the resistance of the clay depending on what kind of forms they want to sculpt so in cg the more polygons is the more resistance so you can see here like you know it's taking me more effort to round this out so mm -hmm. if i drop it down then now there's it's easier for me to make bigger movements and in the beginning it's all about big movements so another way to think about things if you're not familiar with the like classifications of shape, you have primary shape, the biggest ones, which is kind of just the silhouette, honestly, is a good way to think about primary shape. And then you have secondary shape, which be the interior. And so it's primary shape is the fewest amount of shapes, uh, the biggest ones. And then so we're talking about just the overall, like if you were to saran wrap your model, that would be the primary shape. So that's mm -hmm. also where proportion and likeness come in. Secondary shape is a higher amount of shapes and they're more complicated. And then tertiary is the most amount of shapes and the most complicated. That's what you're talking about. A million little pores and little wrinkles and stuff. And that stuff's not as crucial to things like likeness and all that. It's really only um, there for, you know, depending on what you're doing, like we might not even do that in this sculpt, but depends mm -hmm. on what you do. And then that's kind of a different thing, but that's a little bit more straightforward too. And you can kind of do that on anything, but when it comes to doing studies, uh, I don't prioritize detail since I, I feel confident that, you know, we could make details fun and cool, but mm -hmm. the more reps you get on the beginning stages, the better you're going to be as a sculptor, the more things you're going to be able to make, the more confident you'll be. Mm -hmm. And that's another kind of main goal for doing these studies is to jump in. You know, I also do studies of hands, which yeah, I've seen you, you know, do a lot of different like studies of hands, which is hands are yeah. complicated. Yeah, hands are complicated and uh, you don't want to do them. I don't really always want to do them. And that was the idea of doing them. It's like, I was like, you know, I just, I don't want to be scared of doing hands. So let's mm -hmm. just do hands. I see that even with like 2D artists who are like, you know, I, I uh, not to throw names out there, but like the Rob Liefeld effect of not being able to draw hands or, or feet, right? And, you know, people yeah. being afraid of that. And so just focusing on that can really up your game right is like Absolutely. something that you need to work on it's challenging and it's it sometimes is like frustrating because you don't get what you want especially the first several times but absolutely uh, it's so helpful for you no exactly but what you just said is so key right because most of my students will and and i get it because i was the same that's why i'm trying to give advice you know like mm -hmm. uh, like i'm in a time machine and i'm like listen to me this is a, this is this is what's <laughs> happening um you know someone will want to make a good looking character and so they they'll they'll just try to make the best character ever you know mm -hmm. and so they'll have like a backstory and it's the crazy costume and it's going to be hyper real and it's going to have all this stuff and so it's like early on they're putting all their eggs in this basket and the truth is you're not gonna i i'm not mm -hmm. really happy with my work now mm -hmm. so it's it's an ongoing thing to come to grips with that you're not going to ever reach this pedestal that you might set for yourself, even if you're not conscious of it. Uh, so you're going to be failing. And the idea with studies is that you can fail a lot more so you can grow a lot faster and then you can apply it to these bigger projects, you know, cause you're going to be more equipped and more confident in the fundamentals of stuff so that you can just focus on like technical quality or putting time in. But just like you said, if you do, if you do 10 hands, if you do 10 heads, mm -hmm. I promise you, your last three are going to be better than your first three. Absolutely. And 
And if you were doing full big projects, we're talking years. It takes so mm -hmm. long to do big projects. So totally. I'm going to pop over to mine real quick. I ended up choosing this Rorschach image or, or this Sick. actor because it's not as extreme, but I kind of like this like just dead yeah. look like this face that he has. I want to try to get that kind of expression out of it. So I'm going to go with that. As you're Sick. starting, as I see that you are blocking in the primary forms, you have your reference on the side. Mm -hmm. What are you looking for with your, you're just starting? Is it bones? Is it just the block out? Like, yeah. what is it that you're saying? Like, okay, this is going in the right direction. Yeah, it's kind of both of those things. Um, I'm also kind of juggling right now with like how the, what the composition of the sculpt is going to be. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, how much of the shoulders are going to be in it and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just want to get like the main head shape. I'm also using, a, you can see my brushes on the lower left. You know, mm -hmm. if you're ever really curious, I don't use that many brushes, but I'm using the clay. I use the clay buildup. So yeah, right now I'm just working on a block out and then I'm probably going to ZB mesh. So like, cause his mouth's open. So I'm oh, going right. to make a cavity for the mouth and then, um, and then I'm going to start getting into the expression. So right now this is just about getting a human shape. Uh, and then we'll worry about the rest in a second. So I might have to go up a little bit more, but like the ears need to come out. So right now I'm, I'm blocking out, but I'm also thinking about Z remesh. Mm. Like I, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with, I have a pretty good guess, although Z remesh, you know, constantly surprises me <laughs> with what happens, but I'm trying to make a mesh in a way that's going to be predictable. So like, you know, I want these ears to, to be separate. Also, right. I try to remind myself, kind of back to the same point with limiting yourself on topology. You know, I mentioned that studies end up as images, most mm -hmm. likely. So I try to remind myself, like right now, the ear isn't that important and the back of the head isn't that important. So for time, I'm going to, you know, that's where I'm going to cut stuff. But for my own sake, you know, I end up, I'm always spinning it around and sculpting it in 3D, obviously. Sculpting it so, in the round, um, even though you're not necessarily going to see the back. Yeah, but I, I yeah, so I try to tell myself not to waste too much time there, but sometimes it's informative, but also like as a study and as, you know, I don't want to just practice faces all the time. I want to make sure that it looks like a head in 3D, but I'll definitely cut out some time there. Like, you know, maybe the ear, uh, definitely the back of the head. I'm also not sure how I'm going to do the hair yet. That might be sculpted. If we have extra time at the end, maybe I'll try fiber mesh, but I might just do it as like a, you know, like a marble look where it's just sculpted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's it right now. It's just going to make this base mesh. Cool. Uh, non necessarily art topic. What do you Actually, listen to or watch while you're, while you're working? Yeah. I like to listen to music. Um, I'll, uh, I'll watch something sometimes and that's kind of like a treat. So like really late at night, if I've worked for a few hours, mm -hmm. uh, then I'll be like, okay, I'll put something on hopefully um like if i'm doing rendering that's mm -hmm. a good time because there's a lot of sitting around but mm -hmm. i find myself to be way more productive if i'm listening to music and not watching stuff even a podcast like mm -hmm. it slows me down i think because, because of the language is it yeah yeah so it's the music is that you listen to is it like purely instrumental or do you listen to like i, I listen to i listen to a lot of stuff i like listening to the top 40 sometimes mm -hmm. my favorite stuff is like um Hip hop, probably R and B stuff. Mm -hmm. I have different. I have different playlists. I also, when I do big projects, sometimes like, like for I've done a couple of cyberpunk projects. Like I make a cyberpunk playlist and try mm -hmm. to just live in that headspace. Yeah, I find that um, super helpful. Yeah, like trying to get into the headspace of whatever thing or zone that you're making. Yeah, definitely. I think it really helps. All right, let's just get going with this and make. A, let's make it. Let's make a uh, mouth cavity too. I know you said you have your brushes in the bottom left and you don't use a ton. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll get the question though. What are some of your top ones that you use? Yeah, the move brush, obviously number one. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, I can tell you because I have on a hotkey. So mm -hmm. uh, one is my move brush. Two is my clay, clay buildup. Three is damn standard. And four is my own standard brush, which is just the standard brush. And then I mm -hmm. chose this alpha. See one of these little chisel tips. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I changed the lazy mouse settings just because um zbrush's defaults uh like aren't aren't that usable for some reason <laughs> so i have i found myself changing it every time so i just saved my own standard brush uh so those are the main four brushes and then i put my second 
most used brushes in this quick select palette down here. Mm -hmm. So you can see like H pal H polish. So those are the ones that like aren't are not your hotkeys. Those are not my hotkeys. That's like my right. second my second tier, you know? Those are the people on deck. And then if I have to fish out a brush, I'll fish out a brush for like random stuff. As you're thinking about Z remesh, it looks like you're kind of just focusing on like general shape, like eye, nose, mouth, so that when it Z remeshes that it creates good loops there, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. I might even have to, uh, I'll probably go up in Dynamesh just before doing this too. Um, right now I'm keeping the geo low, like we talked about. So it's easy for me to make big changes fast. Um, but then I'm going to need to like Z remesh, uh, works more predictably on smooth stuff. So the fact mm -hmm. that this is low poly and jagged, it's going to get confused. Um, but yeah, I'm also going to do the eyes like kind of closed and then, uh, I can put in an eye sphere and just intersect. I'm just, I mean, I'm familiar with that being the way to do it yeah. i could try to do loops around the eyelid um but you never know if it's going to come out right you know mm -hmm. so i'll probably go up a little bit right now we'll now, get ready i know this is a you know we're obviously working on a head sculpt for the heads part but i also find the part that you're doing right now of you know prepping for just the workflow part with the software can be helpful for for studies as well doing doing it a different way each time you know trying one day i'll do it just in dynamesh one day i'll do it i'll try to do a nice z remesh one day i'll start from a base mesh and to kind of yeah. explore what those workflows are and how what works best for me you know yeah no that's good i mean just that's another part of of this study or doing studies and something that's hard to convince people that it's it's worth doing mm -hmm. is that uh you know i can't promise like what you would learn but it's going to mm -hmm. be stuff. And uh, like one of the main things is just the, the mileage, just the experience mm -hmm. of using the software, you know, something that I forget that not everyone has in that I use ZBrush every day pretty much. Mm -hmm. And I've used it for whatever, almost 10 years. So um, things are second nature. It's another point of making hotkeys. Mm -hmm. So I'm not thinking about how to use ZBrush. And so someone learning has that layer of things going on. So mm -hmm. that's why I think it's important to choose subjects that are lower in scope, still interesting. You know, if you're into if you're into characters and creatures, if you want to do that, then it should probably be anatomy based. So mm -hmm. like sculpting a foot one day, sculpting a hand, sculpting an ear. Mm -hmm. Those are things that might not sound that exciting, but they're extremely important in like getting familiar with sculpting, getting familiar with ZBrush, getting familiar with, you know, making meshes and and all that stuff. So you're going to become a better sculptor at anything you want to sculpt if you do that stuff. And that's that's why I do stuff like this, because you never know. All right, let's see what happens here. You going for the zebra mesh? Probably. Um, so another thing I'll do is, like, see, I have damn standard, and I just hold alt uh -huh. to make, a, like, a sharp edge. Because, <laughs> um, you know, hopefully... Uh, Z remesher sees that. Uh, you can question, also use uh, polygroups. Yeah, what's up? Uh, on mine, I'm using a, a. I've kind of got this block out ish, right? Yeah. Uh, he's got kind of a closed mouth. Would you sculpt it, do the Z remesh on the mouth, or would you close it, just like sculpt it straight into the mesh? Yeah, you could actually just sculpt that into the mesh if you wanted. You know, if you you could keep it very sculptural by keeping mm -hmm. it dynamish, and then um, you could just have some little teeth. You could actually mm -hmm. just have a. Start like with a sphere and then just draw some damn standard teeth in there mm -hmm. and then push the geo into it. So just have intersecting geo and then that would probably look fine. All right, I'm going to try that then. I was like debating making a whole mouth for it and I'm like, it's just so subtly. Oh, but then, mm, you know, you could go back and forth. Yeah, exactly. I might, I might try it though. I'll say uh, one of the major benefits of using Z Remesher. All right, let's, let's get into that now actually. Uh, Okay. One of the big benefits of using Z remesher is, um, well, you know, to generate a base mesh that really the benefit is of having a base mesh is that it's a low polygon version, mm. you know? So if I'm working in, in divisions, then that means that I can go up and down all the time. And that's my preferred way to sculpt when I'm sculpting, like seriously mm -hmm. in, in Dynamesh, you're only going in one direction. And right. so like in that example I gave earlier, 
it's like if you're sculpting clay, you're just making the clay harder and harder and harder over time. So you can't drop down. Uh, so like in your in your um, in your subject that you chose, mm-hmm. I think uh, the the subtle head tilt is mm-hmm. super important too, mm-hmm. and that's something that you could refine even at the end of the process if you wanted really easily because you could just drop down the subdivisions and draw a mask, blur it, and move stuff. Whereas if it's Dynamesh, it's just like frozen at that point. Yeah, you're kind you of know? stuck. Yeah, you're stuck. I think I am going to try the Z rematch. I'm going to follow, try to follow what you're doing today. Cool. Let's see if it works. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, dude. I and mean, that's another thing about sculpts. You know, I'm also, you know, I was coming on here to do a demo and I was like, listen, I don't want to. You know, who knows what's going to happen? But I was like, you know what? That's that's whole, part of the whole process. I'm just trying to do this like I would do it on my own. And on mm-hmm. my own, that's kind of the the thing is I was like, you know, if it screws up, that's fine. It was just a night and you still get all of those important things I mentioned. Like mm-hmm. maybe you don't get a cool image to show on social media, but that's not the point. The point right. is getting better at sculpting and getting better at the program and, and doing this kind of stuff is the best way to do that. Yeah. I mean, you're probably like me where you have folders upon folders of projects that will never see the light of day because they're studies or they're, they didn't yeah. get what you wanted or yeah, I think that's, that's very normal. But, but I think it's something that students and especially beginners don't always recognize that, that, that the, the work behind the work, right? The work behind yeah, exactly. everybody, yeah. that everybody's the mileage is, is invisible. It's- it's probably social media throwing a curveball on that because we didn't have that. So we, you know, mm-hmm. but there was that competition at school that oh, yeah. I think was um, probably really important. You know, that was one of my favorite things about school was, was nice. that competition was that sort of like, you know, the drive, everybody competing yeah. for this, not necessarily like the same thing, but everybody wants to get better. Right. Yeah. And so if one person, all of it, you know, you're at school better. for yeah. If one person gets better, you're like, I want to be better. I want to be yeah, at exactly. least as good as them or better than them. And there's yeah. this kind of one upping that happens. That is, in a lot of ways, I find it is also very productive though, because it's like absolutely that was great. How did you do that? Like, and if you get a good group of people, they'll help you, help you do that as well. They'll teach you what they did, in return for you teaching them what you learned. No, for sure. If you can do like, if you can keep it like friendly competition, you know, essentially. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that's so important. All right, well, we made a base mesh. Looks pretty good. Good enough for what we're doing. Mm-hmm. So now let's start getting it kind of in there. Another it, another cool thing about doing studies like this uh, for me is, uh, you know, the extra challenge again and the difference um, from – sorry, one second – good i'm just gonna save cool. friendly reminder to always save <laughs> yep i just saved myself um yeah uh asymmetry sculpting something asymmetrical mm-hmm. is uh is awesome because it's the extra layer of difficulty it's also just more like sculptural in a way mm-hmm. um, and it's just not something you do in production so mm-hmm. i again i think it's another like confidence thing where you get to do this creative challenge but then also, um, you know, when you're doing a when you're doing something symmetrical, then you can appreciate it more. Absolutely. When when do you like if you're not going to sculpt in asymmetry? Uh, when do you start bringing in that or breaking that symmetry? You when I like in this case when I'm doing something asymmetrical. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Or what do you mean? I mean, like some projects you're doing it, like you are, how, I guess the question is how far do you start symmetrical and when do you, is there like a common time mm-hmm. when you're like, I'm going to break symmetry or are you starting from the very beginning without symmetry? If it's a very asymmetrical project. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be, it's kind of like in this case, um, uh, I'm going to be doing it. Like I'm going to try to block out the forms of the face to get it in an okay spot um, just to save myself time. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to, so it kind of depends on what I'm doing. And if I want to up the difficulty, like it's an interesting challenge is to just sculpt the whole time without symmetry, but it's going to take twice as long 
and it's not going to be as good. It's going to be very tedious. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just trying to use it to my my advantage, really. Um, that's the idea right now. So I'm, I'm just going to block this out. Probably going to do the eyes, too. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, just the general shape of the face. So still, because I'm still working on primary shapes. So definitely after primary shapes, but I'm probably going to block in all the major secondary stuff too. And then it's just pushing and pulling and refining at that point. Gotcha. So you kind of use it as like a symmetry as like a building block to get the core form or the core things that you need before you start going away from that. Yeah. But you're not necessarily like, you know, I see different artists use different workflows and some are going to sculpt all the way to the pore level detail or all the way till, you know, secondary forms or even some tertiary forms are done and then they pose and then maybe they, you know, break it up. Yeah, I, I do that for professional work, for mm -hmm. sure. Okay. I uh, And often, often like in a professional setting, I'll put asymmetry on a layer in ZBrush mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. I can change it and if someone doesn't like it or I can go more or less. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, yeah, like people aren't going to notice symmetrical pores. Right. That's and pores is very time consuming. So there's like no reason to not do symmetrical pores. Um, and then, yeah, all the sculpting, like we talked about, I mean, you know, literally saving you half the time it might even be more. It might actually, it actually might take more than twice the time to, <laughs> you know, cause you're like going back and forth and you're like, Oh, that doesn't look right. That doesn't look right. Oh, okay. You're like, Oh, so you're like, Oh, one side has way more or it's way denser. Like I, I didn't do it the same way. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, yeah, again, getting, I getting to, uh, yeah, do you use, do you use polygroups? Yeah. I use polygroups all the time. Um, for something like this, we'll see how it shakes out, but I'll probably make polygroups for the upper and lower eyelids and the jaw. Cause those are the parts that I want to select the most, but yeah, polygroups are just something that are really good for, Speaking of, somehow I turned off symmetry. <laughs> huh. Well, here we can do a we can do a little. This is how you get it back. Sometimes okay. people ask me that. Uh, so I'm gonna mask one side, then we're gonna go over here to our smart resim, and then that'll resim. Oh, do it this way, smart resim, and then I'll turn it back on. Uh, yeah. What did you ask me? Oh yeah, polygroups. Yeah, poly I definitely groups. use those. Definitely. Uh, I got a question from Twitch. Have you ever done statue or figure work before? Uh, once so far. Um, hasn't come out yet, but uh, I had a lot of help with the parts that make that. I really just did the sculpt, mm -hmm. and then I passed it to them, and he did the, the keys and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I haven't done that myself, but it is something that is more... Uh, achievable nowadays because of uh, the way that the booleans work mm -hmm. in um, ZBrush. So yeah, it's something that I'm interested in though, but I've only done that one time so far. Yeah, it's a fun thing. It's a uh, getting into the keys and all the ways that the pieces fit together is it's a, uh, it's a fun process. Like, you know, to, to go through something that's practical, like how is it actually going to fit? It's a very different mindset than like, a digital world where everything can kind of uh, intersect and doesn't really need to have pure realism in it, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I've done some work when I worked for Legacy. Uh, Legacy effects. I did some statues for oh, Sideshow yeah, so and stuff. Oh, that's uh, awesome, dude. Which was, which was fun and getting into a lot of 3D printing there. So I got to do some learning a lot about that. That was a very different world than, you know, post I, I had graduated expecting or, or thinking i was going to work in games right away and so i started working right away in 3d printing and it was like oh this is very very different than what i trained for uh, but at the same time it was really great to have that in my mindset because all of a sudden i started thinking practically like how do things work yeah that's awesome uh, which is very different for sure That's uh, an awesome pedigree there. Those two companies are sick. Oh yeah, they're all, they're. I was very fortunate to work to, that to be my first position <laughs> to work with those guys. Pull this. 
Uh, we did have a question about kind of just the state of the industry with 3D concept art, right? You know, a lot of, uh -huh. like you were saying, we got kind of the question basically coming from you saying, you know, you're doing a sculpt, but it's going to end up as a 2D image. image. Mm -hmm. um, that and, you know, concept art, obviously, now there's a lot of artists using 3D for concept yeah. art. Which is Any, good. I don't know, just like kind of thoughts or like... Yeah, do it. Kind of get curious about it. Yeah, definitely do it. Um, my thoughts are this. So yeah, obviously I'm not a conceptual artist, um, but if I were, if that's what I wanted to be, uh, I would, yeah, I would learn um, some 3D stuff and incorporate it. Anything that would make my stuff better. Um, we have a we have a tendency as artists to make things a lot harder on ourselves than they need to be. That's kind of a little bit of part of what the exercise that we're doing right now, but I, mm -hmm. I want to be conscious about I'm creating some handicap uh, to do this exercise, to work on my skills. You know, it's like exercise uh, or, or training versus like game day. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it comes to making the actual thing, like so in concept arts case, it should be about making the best possible image. The best concept artists are the ones that like, you know, a director is going to love them, right? And it, you need to make an image that a director, anybody, people in a boardroom with a bunch of suits can look at and go, yeah, that we need that in the game. Mm -hmm. So if it's like all cool and artsy and brushstrokey and interpretive and the hands are all blurry and there's like, you know, it looks like a, like an awesome abstract painting um, that might make other artists think that it's dope, but mm -hmm. it doesn't achieve the goal. Conceptual art isn't for hanging on a wall. Conceptual art is for getting an idea sold. And then it goes on to, it's a, it's a, it's a mix of art. Everything that we're doing in the entertainment industry really is a mix of art and, and technical stuff or, or like a product. Mm -hmm. So it needs to, it needs to deliver that. It needs to sell it. That's it's kind of different types of con conceptual art early on. It's more about selling. That doesn't have to be as, as finished, but then, it goes on to people like me, like modelers and stuff. So the more clear the image is, the more like physical it looks, the more believable it is. And that, so that comes down to like the anatomy, the lighting, the rendering, the composition, and then there's the taste and the design. So I feel like of all the entertainment art disciplines, conceptual art is the most competitive because it has the lowest barrier to entry. And it's also very human everybody no matter their age or walk of life can see a drawing and go ah he drew that that's awesome <laughs> then when it gets right. more technical it's like you know people probably still think i draw you know they sure. don't really know what all this weird modeling stuff is so if you can incorporate 3d into your images uh it should make better images you'll get you know you'll get awesome lighting and stuff so there's no reason to make yourself paint it you know like you're a renaissance painter or something like that mm -hmm. so why not use every tool i know blender is very popular mm -hmm. with a lot of uh concept artists because it's free and it has really good renderer so that's you know a place to start absolutely it's kind of a good tangent uh we got a just got a question from twitch and uh they're asking uh, hey guys, I'm new to this world, but I'm starting to get into 3D modeling. What's your best advice to get started? Um, depends on what you're what you're into. If you're into characters, then ZBrush is the is what you want to get comfortable with, um, mm -hmm. and you can you can get it at ZBrushCore.com. And there's even a free, free version if you just want to play with it. I think it's Core yeah. Mini. Yeah. I think you can go to zbrushcore.com though. I'm not. I might be okay. mistaken, but I'm pretty sure you can get that for free there. Um, but yeah, it's a little confusing because there's something called Mini, whatever that is. But but yeah, you can get the free version of ZBrush, which lets you do stuff and sculpt. It lets you do the stuff we're doing right now, and you can do studies, which would be what we're doing right now. And then yeah, you do this, and you keep doing this, and then you'll get comfortable with it. That that was kind of my game plan, looking back. Um, Again, I feel like that naivete that you have when you're young really helped out. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. looking back, I'm like, I don't think I would have made those decisions and I probably would have overthought the crap out of everything. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember that my plan was to just get really good at modeling. That right. was my plan. I was like, I'm going to get really good at modeling. And also back then, like one of the major influences in the industry was um, Epic, 
Uh, they're they're the ones that popularize normal maps to everybody. Um, you know, their Gears of War game. Uh, then they put out their um, ZBrush images and they did some talks. There's a oh, yeah. D'Artiste book yep. uh, called Character Modeling where you can see their high poly models and wireframes. Anyways, they they really changed the game. And at that time, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> excuse me, there was modelers and then there was texture artists. Hmm. So they were different disciplines. And I was like, yeah, I'm just going to get really good at modeling. And then, uh, so I'm not going to focus on anything else. And so for years, that's what I did. And I think that paid off because later on, I got more interested in texturing and lighting and rendering. So I've kind of slowly built up over time um, the different things that can, you know, allow me to make more full projects on my own, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. And then it, it lucked out that uh, like in the industry, you know, at least every job I've had, um, I've had to texture too, which is good. I enjoy texturing, but, um, but I think the fact that I focus on modeling in the beginning was probably a benefit. So that's what I would recommend to people if, if you're into characters and if you're in hard service, it's still modeling is king. If you're into, you know, if you want to be a modeler also renderers have gotten easier, uh, and more accessible. I mean, like I said, even blender is really good. And then if you're doing hard surface, you know, you could do things like Octane, like uh, Vitaly or or Redshift even. And they do, uh, you know, in terms of renderers, they have plastics and metals figured out. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you can render plastic and metal and glass and stuff physically accurate uh, pretty easily nowadays. Yeah, I think when, when like, I guess it's just kind of like when PBR really entered games specifically, but it kind of changed it to where you weren't really working with, you know, every, like you weren't controlling your spec map to make it look like metal or something separate. It was, you're applying this material that is metal and you have this library of things that you're now working with. And, you know, that and 3D painters like Substance Painter, obviously, or, or Quixel or yeah. whatever the, the preferred choice is, has made the, it just made it a lot easier to kind of get into, I think. And to understand it, it's way more artist friendly than it was. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't believe what we were doing. Like, I, I <laughs> like you know, I'm really bad at at uh, at whatever that's called, like the like predicting or or knowing how to make things better. Like, you know, when I when I get asked at a studio, sometimes this might sound bad, but like, you know, if a tools tools person will say, "What can I do to make your life easier?" I'm just like, mm -hmm. I don't know, dude. I'm just I have no idea. I just yeah. exist. I just do whatever. <laughs> I use whatever tools I have, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so when PBR came out, uh, and that was during, for me, that was on Evolve. So we made mm -hmm. Evolve for like three years without PBR. So all the all my experience up till then, which is about six years, mm -hmm. was no PBR, just, just the way that they were doing it, like just the way everybody was doing it. And then, um, yeah, PBR came out, which stands for Physically Based Rendering, if people don't know. It's, it's a paradigm, um, like a rule set that everyone follows because it's like the renderers were made to take on this paradigm so that it's standardized that's the key it's standardized uh rendering textures in real time so all of a sudden it enabled people to share values and textures and mm -hmm. you could say like oh i want to make a metal this well th this is how to get in those ranges and before we were all just in Photoshop, just freaking <laughs> just changing Dang. stuff yeah. and, and saving it and looking and going, ah, oh, that looks kind of metal. And then, you know, we were putting yeah. color in our spec. We were bananas, dude. Everybody, I can't believe it. Like looking back, I can't believe it. We were all, it was the wild west, dude. It was crazy. And I didn't know. I was just like, yeah, this is, this is what well, it, it was. It was the workflow. It was, this is how you do it. Like you just, yeah. as an artist, you just make it look good. Like just, yeah. it's up to your art, your, you know, your artistic eye to make it look good. But yeah, then it was, now it was crazy. Like, somebody else was like, no, 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 everybody, you, you guys are all fine, but it's like your taste is all off. We need to have one yeah, specific one that we'll go from and i think what you notice with that is the the consistency of not just like a game but all games have kind of gone mm -hmm. up like the, the level of absolutely. quality has gone up significantly absolutely i mean yeah i mean it brings everyone up in the studio because yeah it used to be like everyone individually it was up to everyone so that's why it always looked inconsistent
I am almost, I'm, I'll show you where I'm at just so we can see. I kind of got this. I, pretty, I like to stay pretty low as nice. well. I haven't had any subdivision levels yet. Nice. So kind of getting in there. When it comes to like the eyes and stuff like that, what do you, I know you said you were going to like, you know, put a sphere yeah, in or something. Yeah, let's do that. How do you, how do you do that? Yeah, we're going to, let's do that right now. We'll do some, we'll do some spheres. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to, uh, oh, wow. Oh, it saved it. Whoopsie daisy. All right. Um, sphere 3D. Sure. I'm going to rotate it just because. They could put like the poles on the end. Mm -hmm. All right. And then we're going to scale it. Try to get it generally the right size. Now, this is something in production. Again, I would take more time doing. I'm going to kind of guesstimate a little based on my experience a little bit how big eyes are. But um, if you if you make the eyes too big or too small, that's going to influence everything, you know, because then the eyelid fits on the eye, and then the eyebrow fits over the eyelid. So, um, also, I mean, if we want to get really geeky here, just to just to talk about it, um, you know, the eye will come out a little bit like that, and then it also is rotated out just a little bit, like four degrees let's say so if i were to mirror it um we can do this mirror right now <clears throat> and we'll put it in here and then so the eyelid will fit on that so if you get that shape a little bit closer then uh you know it'll help inform everything so this is why it's good to get eyes in early um, because we're going to see how the face automatically looks super derpy now all of a sudden and we're like, oh my gosh, and then we got to fix it. Yeah, this is when I like, you know, I like to sculpt in, in Dynamesh and I'll have like a sculpt with a eyes closed and it looks good. And then I try to put an eyeball in and I'm yeah. like, oh no, what have I done? Like, yeah, <laughs> here Classic. we go. Yeah. So I'm just going to, um, this is probably what I'm going to do for this. I'm just going to brute, brute force it. So I can go up in subdivision right now just to do this because I can. I can always go down in subdivision again, but I'm just gonna carve in a, a eye hole here because who cares? It's fine. Again, this wouldn't be how we do it in production, but we're just saving so much time and getting right to the whole sculpting of it. Looks like my eyes might be tiny and far apart. Scary. You but even though see, you like, kind of just addressed like, that there's a problem, like you said, you know, tiny and far apart, you're still going to get the shape before you fix that, it looks like. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, another maybe way to simplify, too, like how I work, which, again, might not be – it's not efficient, that's for sure. But I like to get things in fast and then iterate and fix it. So it's, it's easier for me to identify problems and – um and start fixing it if it's in there rather than, you know, it's kind of a balance for me. Like I can easily go too fast and then it's like, Oh crap. Now I'm causing more problems for myself, but I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be a, a little bit uh, intentional and, uh, and at the same time, not like over overthinking it. So just getting something there. That's, that's kind of a, a skill that I'm still, um, trying to get better at is that being intentional the right kind of intention you know like fewer i think that's something as all artists get older and they keep practicing is how can i achieve what i want in fewer brush strokes you know mm -hmm. instead of because it's definitely common early on for everybody to just like sculpt a million different you know and that's how you get muddy surfaces i think is subdividing too high and yeah. and not being intentional with your forms like not thinking about a few amount of categories you're just kind of mindlessly dancing around which is you know what i did forever too so i get I think it. it also makes you faster though when you can understand how to, to yeah. quickly make a shape or make something in two strokes or three strokes versus 50 right yeah you can get it there so quick and then you can adjust it rather than spending you know i see this a lot with with people who are beginning who will spend you know hours or days just on the eyelid it's yeah you know, versus somebody who can just boop 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 and they get it in so quickly and i think there's a mileage element to that i think or a lot of that but it's also 
uh, I think a confidence of saying like, I know that my first stroke isn't going to be perfect. You know, even, even after I get this in, it's not going to be perfect, but I can adjust it afterwards and I can spend a lot of time afterwards to get it there. Uh, yeah, um, there's also, it reminds me of this saying, um, fast is slow and slow is fast. And I think it's super true. And it's something that's counterintuitive. You know, you think you need to be also, we know we're all watching time lapses on YouTube. It makes people look like they're geniuses. Sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's actually, um, like being slower and intentional is going to be faster overall. I completely agree. And I think that's something that I've tried to learn myself over time is, you know, slowing down, slowing down and being more intentional. Exactly what you're saying is, has, has been more valuable to me than trying to say, okay, I'm going to do this in, you know, even if I said I'm only giving give myself ten minutes or thirty minutes to do like a super fast sculpt, yeah. If I say you know, this time I'm going to do it with a lot of I'm just going to do it as fast as I can, no thought into it. Versus I'm going to be very intentional with every move I make. The intentional mm -hmm. move I make is always going to be better. Always, yeah. I uh, got a question from Twitch, which is asking: um, When you're doing these likenesses and the studies, do you care about the focal length? Or the field of view yeah of the camera uh yeah so uh yeah for those that don't know like cameras all different kinds of lenses have different distortions um so like if you were to trace something uh, a good example is if i were to take the perspective out of my model so now this is orthographic it has no perspective if i were to bring in a, a concept or a, a reference image and try to trace it it would come out super wrong mm -hmm. because my reference is at one focal length. So it has a certain distortion to it. And then this has no distortion to it. So you can see like the size of things mm -hmm. and position of things changing. So when it comes to doing actual likenesses, that might be a good time to bring this up too. When it comes to doing actual likenesses, you know, accuracy is key. Measurement is key. So trying to match focal lengths of cameras, um, actually bringing in the image in ZBrush and tracing it, uh, doing paint overs is what I'll do too. I'll like do a render and then paint over to, to fix it in Photoshop using all those kinds of tools. And then I'll give myself a guide on how to fix it again. So it's iteration and stuff like that. So doing likenesses is painstaking mm -hmm. and it's something I try to avoid personally. Uh, so these kinds of studies are meant to be loose. I want to get rid of burdens like that. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make, um, something that feels naturalistic you know believable might be a strong word for something that's going to look sketchy but that's the idea to make it look like a person and in this case it could be like uh, the good references are like old um renaissance type sculptures and stuff because those are made you know from stone and so they don't have tertiary detail it's a great example for a sculpture that looks great that doesn't have any tertiary detail so that's more of what i'm focused on now and yeah, likeness, I'm not trying to uh, get it perfect because I'm not going to get it perfect. It would just take a lot of time. That's the key mm -hmm. to doing it. And measurement, like you're saying. So being accurate like that, more important when you're doing um, for real likeness, like if you're doing it you know, for a job or, or for a project. Likenesses are so are incredibly difficult. And the people that do them really well, I'm very jealous of. Yeah. They've clear, but they've also clearly spent a lot of time practicing them yeah to do a couple and I mean, for work and they're hard they're really hard yeah they're really hard um like i say really time consuming and also in my opinion they're a dying mm. job um i think there's always room for and like when i do likenesses it's for the challenge it's to practice those fundamentals but in terms of like if you want to do things as a paid gig, which I'm, I don't think everybody should want to do, but if that is what you want to do, I don't think likenesses are going to be a job for long because scanning is going to get cheaper and better and uh, more people want to scan. I mean, that's what people want to do right now. Like all the higher ups want to scan because it represents mm -hmm. taking out the human equation and just, you know, getting what you want for money, just buying like, you know, I could just, I could look at a book of models hire them for the day, scan mm -hmm. them. I could scan actors. 
Uh, so the whole like manual labor part of it doesn't seem to make as much sense more and more, you know, especially, you know, you can also buy them. You could, yeah. Yeah. You could buy them, especially if you want to get a likeness of a specific person for like a game or something. Yeah. It, everything I've seen in the past several years is, is scanning. It's scanning, scanning expressions, you know, it's the whole thing. Um, rather than, you know, asking an artist or a group of artists to sculpt those expressions and to sculpt the whole thing would be so, so time consuming and it, it would never, as talented as they may be, they, it would never be to the same quality. It no, it wouldn't be the same quality, no. That, that's why I think playing to your strengths would be good. So it depends on what you're doing. So if you're doing like a Call of Duty game and you're casting an actor, then you should, it makes sense that they're going to, they're going to scan and they're going to hire the actor, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, so then if you're not doing that, um, then what you could do is, um, just have it be a little bit otherworldly, you know, like hyper real is, is the term I often use. Hmm. And that's my, my more preferred, like kind of style it makes sense because it's, you know, it's, I, you know, I make characters by hand and so that has a certain quality to it. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, that's wise of production is just to lean into that and you could go even more stylized if you wanted yeah, I mean, I think one of the big games that probably sticks out, maybe the most for me, is is Dishonored. Yeah, it has oh, yeah. a very specific style. It's realistic, but it's stylized. You can tell that that's handcrafted, right? You can tell that mm -hmm. it's got a cool, intentional art look, art style to it, but it's it's not scanned. Like I think there's really good examples of not scanned games for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think scanning is is already a huge thing, especially, you know, I don't maybe some people don't know it, but in the game industry, it's it's huge, especially for for hero characters. I mean, I I worked on a game, uh, Cloud Imperium, where all the characters were scanned, every single head was scanned. Yeah, um, we may sculpt on them a little bit to do proportions or you know maybe some texture changes and stuff like that, but it was still almost 100 uh, percent scanned heads. Yeah. Um, like I say, depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to, if they're trying to make a game with realistic people, quote unquote, mm -hmm. um, then I think they're going to scan it. It just makes sense. It's like an investment, you know, it's like, why would you risk it, you know, by having an artist do it? Mm -hmm. So yeah, really common. Uh, the one that sticks out to me is, um, the uh, early Uncharted games, even now, they don't scan mm. everything, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, no, they but don't. They, uh, yeah, they scan some people now, but it used to be the first several. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a big inspiration to me, is is they just decided to hand make everything. Um, and that gave it a style. And I, I always think that's awesome. You know, and you're leaning into it. Like, Uncharted was renowned for its look. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so it's an example of I mean, you know, not to, so, I mean, you know, when Kevin Spacey was in Call of Duty, mm -hmm. uh, there was mixed reaction, but, True. but, uh, Uncharted has always been thought of as a beautiful game. So it's, it's interesting that, that there's always going to, in my opinion, there's always going to be a place for the handcrafted look. It just depends on the production's goals, what they want. Mm -hmm. But I think it has to be consistent across everything. Like you have to kind of like say, this is the vision of our game is what we want it to look like it's it's going to be a handcrafted looking game so it's that's that to me is about the, the art direction of the of, or the company yeah. making a choice and sticking with it rather than saying oh we want this over here or a stylized background yeah. or have realistic faces like you got to kind of yeah, stick sure. to it but well, so you put a little bit of a uh, toy plastic on the eyes do you do that just to kind of give it that that reflection yeah. yeah um yeah and like right now um like I'm probably gonna, it depends on how I finish this. I'm not sure, but I might do the eye as like, like a sculpted thing. I don't know, mm. but it just helps me like, you know, like it looks wrong right now. So they'll help me like position them. Um, okay. Here's another thing. So I'll, I'll do this to just to, just to drive the point home, but I'll often, um, let's do this. Actually. Um, so I'll paint things like, so you saw me paint the eye and then I'll just black out the nostrils. And this is because 
uh, I like to mix, you know, I like to use my gut instinct. Um, mm. We all have, we're all programmed to identify faces and the, the, the graphic shape that faces make is, is what our brains are wired to pick up on. So for me, even though it's temp, like this paint was not going to stay, mm -hmm. it just helps me quickly identify, you know, that it looks bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I can just use my instinct and go like, oh, that looks weird. And, you know, all of a sudden right. it starts to look more like a face. So I like to, I like to put it in. It kind of gives you, you were saying this earlier, but for your process, it kind of gives you a place to work off of, of like, I know this is wrong, but I, I can adjust it. So, you know, it's a, it, it's almost maybe like a mental note of like, I need to come back to this or this needs to be fixed. Yeah. I'm also, yeah, you can see I'm jumping around a lot. I'm just trying to get the face further along. Um, mm -hmm. I might start doing the mouth here pretty soon. I think I'm going to hit some color on my eyes as well and see how I can get them going. Let's see where it is. We did have a question from uh, YouTube. Um, we already switched from Dynamesh to Subdivision pretty early on. Mm -hmm. uh, we did that after we kind of had gotten the base forms. We did we uh, Z remeshed our base and kind of started from there. So that was probably about f forty to thirty minutes ago. Um, so yeah, we're now in Z remeshed meshes. Yeah, which is really just sculpting with subdivisions. You know, you could have a you could start with a base mesh we just essentially made our own base mesh on the fly um to show that process but you could start with you know there's tools up here if you go to tools uh what tool there's base meshes in here already that you could start with um but just starting from nothing to go is is kind of part of the exercise mm -hmm. getting used to the tools but yeah so you know, just like I was showing. So you might see me going up and down a lot. That's that's how I prefer to sculpt. Like I said, it gives me the most control. Uh, so to show you, like, so I have four divisions right now. Um, still limiting, you know, in a way. I'm going to try to stay here as long as I can. But because of the way I'm doing the eyelids, you know, I had to go up a little bit. But you can see, like, so this same brush stroke like this, and then on three, and then on two, and then on one like mm -hmm. the difference. So it gives me control uh, on everything. I get more control on every brush now, including smooth, including masking. And so like in the example I spoke about earlier, heating up clay and freezing clay to, to adjust the resistance, that's that's the way I'm treating subdivisions. I'm going up and down a lot depending on what I'm doing. And that's another thing that I'm not really thinking about too much anymore because mm -hmm. I'm used to doing it. But that's part of the exercises too, is to get used to that kind of stuff. Yeah, just getting, you know, getting used to it, working through the process. I think, you know, people get confused or, or they're like, you know, I, I see this with anatomy. I see this with a lot of different things, but working from beginning to end in a pipeline is, is a, a skill in itself. Like yeah. you can be really good at the beginning or you can be really good at the middle or really good at the end. Like you could be great at doing details, but you may suck at doing primary forms, right? And vice versa, right? You may be great at primary forms, but you may suck at doing detail. And the only way you can really get good at any of the, or, or the whole thing is by going through the whole thing multiple times and over and over and over and over. So doing yeah, yeah. studies, doing projects is the best way to do that for sure. Well said, 100%. Uh, question about my personal ask a question. Do you use mat caps? Do you, what do you, do you, what do you like to use for like your personal setup? I see you have just like the, the gray one. Yeah. These are the mat caps I use on the, on the left. Um, so, uh, so people, in case people don't know, uh, I guess I don't use mat caps. These are all mat caps right here and these are all fake. These are all, um, like the image that you see of the sphere, often people don't know. The mm -hmm. image that you're seeing of the sphere is the shader. So you could literally just make a sphere image and load it. 
so it's totally fake 2D stuff. Mm -hmm. And then down here in standard materials, it's actually, um, you know, dynamic. It's actually being lit. So it's important for me when I'm sculpting to, to see, um, you know, the forms. So I kind of need actual lighting. And then um, I just have different mat caps depending on what I want. So I'm using basic material almost all the time. Mm -hmm. When I start refining forms, I'll use a blend because it's got some shine to it so I can uh, polish the surface. Skin, I use this for when I'm doing things like for uh, displacement maps or even um, doing the, the 3D models for print like we mm -hmm. talked about because this forces you to make clearer forms. Like you see how everything gets washed out. Now I'm like, okay, this needs to be a deep wrinkle. You know, yeah, this that, needs to that be. That skin shader is a real, I mean, the first time I used it, I was like, oh no, like, I don't think I like yeah. this shader, but especially yeah. for things that need to have a lot of detail or gonna be 3D printed, it's really good for that. Yeah, it's really good because it's washing things out and then it just it just makes it easier for you to say like, oh, this needs to be a strong form transition. These, you know, And then you work on this for a while and then when you go back, you're like, oh damn. You know, I, uh, I I was a lot more heavy handed, which is what you want. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to change my perspective to 85. So it's not so crazy. Yeah. And then I've got flat color, which is to check silhouette. Right. Okay. So yeah, those aren't, I guess those aren't technically matte caps. I don't think. No, if you use the light, they're not. I, I mean, I always find it interesting to see like what people use, like what's their preferred, like, method of of yeah the zbrush because i see some people like myself i like to use matte caps quite a bit because they keep me like i just bounce around between just different colors of the same ones uh so i like uh, i use I'm, I'm putting in teeth right now but we'll hide those because they're terrifying Tight, dude. uh okay. so you know kind of like i just have oh thank you uh, these different colors that are kind of the same matte cap different gloss different color different whatever it looks like i painted that matte cap so he has like a milk mustache but uh yeah just kind of the same thing and then i when i want to check it i'll use the basic material and that's the that's all i really use Tight. let's see we got a question um is it worth learning a substance painter Somebody has just a general question about that. Yeah, it depends on uh, on what you're into. I love Substance Painter. It's, um, you know, I commented to people that I didn't feel that way about software since ZBrush, which is mm. a long, long time. <clears throat> I even think, uh, you know, I love ZBrush, so, you know, uh, with peace and love, it's got its things. It's got its things that uh, <laughs> sure, yeah. you got you to get used to, which is fine. I still think um, ZBrush is by far the the best organic modeler. If you were to put it in a category, that's what it is, and it feels the most like um, sculpting or something. You know, I'm I'm not a you know I wasn't a sculptor, but it feels the most artistic. Okay, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when it comes to like making models, it just feels like you're reaching out and touching it and and making it. You know, and then it can handle millions of polygons. So it's the best organic modeler. Uh, Substance Painter is by far the best real-time texture software. And, and it's amazing because like I didn't, again, one of those things about me being bad about realizing like what would make my life easier. I just didn't sit around thinking about that stuff. Mm -hmm. When Substance Painter came out, it, it was a joy to use. I shipped Evolve with Photoshop. We all mm -hmm. use Photoshop. Um, so we had the script. We had a custom script that a tools programmer made that would like you'd put all your textures in folders and then it would run through the script and like export based on names and stuff. So you had these big uh, Photoshop files and obviously you're in 2d and then all of a sudden substance comes along where just with one layer, you can control every aspect like met uh, metalness, roughness, diffuse, and you're looking at it in 3d and it's got real time lighting with shadows. It was such a big shift and using software is something else that I didn't like realize that as 3d artists we're often using software not for its intended purpose mm. and so it's got its own quirks because of that um almost everything that we do is like that except zbrush and then now except substance painter so the fact that like the terminology and every button and all the words are made for doing what i'm doing i was like mm. wow you know 
And, uh, and so you could, you know, you could export multiple texture sets with every, I mean, it's perfect. So if you want to do real time, like if you want to do uh, game art, then yeah, I say it's a must. It's a must. I agree. It's one of those ones where you're like, oh, this is just so easy to use. Like it's so aligned with how I'm wanting to work. It's, you know, I remember I worked, uh, I actually worked on Uncharted 3 and we had those long PSDs that was right before the PBR change, which is Uncharted 4. And long, massive, organized PSDs that the script spits out to all the different names of everything and to all the correct places. Yeah. And, and it, you know, at the time having, you know, others, like it was cool. It was like, this is great. Like, I don't know any other real way to work. Uh, but as soon as like Dubson Painter comes out, it's like, Oh, I would never want to go back to working like that. Like that sounds so difficult. And just, just the idea of yeah. not really painting in 3d in general, um, I don't know why you wouldn't. That's, I guess, the question yeah. I would ask is like, like, why would you not? It's really just people don't know. You know, yeah. I, I I played a small role when I went to respawn. Uh, in in getting the company, at least the team I was on, to switch to Substance Painter, mm -hmm. and there were some people that didn't think we'd be able to do it, and I was like convinced i was like well, i think if they just see like if we just do a good job hmm. showing them and explaining like the difference i mean i think it's a no-brainer and yeah, uh, sure. just show it to them it'll be fine yeah so we spent a long time just making like this pitch um because i think for them they just represented an extra cost and they had used um an early hmm. version of quixel hmm. at the hmm. time just the photoshop plugin hmm. so they they didn't really ex like nothing was like painter at that time hmm. it's just it was so instrumental and also like it goes even deeper the fact that you can save smart materials that you can share a shelf on a drive um it's it's made for teams i mean you know it just goes on and on it's just obviously the best, the best. Yeah, absolutely. we got a lot of questions right now about I guess kind of places to start. We've already kind of chatted about this a little bit, but places to start if you are wanting to do architecture and interiors. We haven't really talked about that too much, environment stuff. And then just also a general question for pipelines for realistic game characters is another question. So maybe let's start with the interior architecture stuff. Have you done much interior architecture things? I, know you're um, a I don't, yeah, I don't exactly know. Um, what that means, I did. I did a lot of drafting in uh, high school. That was kind of my introduction to three D. I don't know if that. I don't know if ArcViz is what we're talking about. I think they're um, just more interested in environments. Environments. Well, um, so I'll speak about games since I know that most <laughs> mostly. Um, I really feel like you split it into two kind of categories, like prop artists become environment artists or maybe they are if you think of it that way like characters specializing characters and then environment art is kind of everything else so it's a lot of different things like learning how to good uh, do good plants um, mm -hmm. learning how to it's really the fundamentals of real-time art to do high poly low poly baking and texturing because then like if you can make a tv then you can and you can make a sofa then all of a sudden you can make an environment so mm -hmm. it's a lot of smaller projects and then you're working on the composition if you're going to make an environment and people do like to see complete environments in their portfolios when they're hiring yeah. you only need a couple um, but then in a studio like you know you'll have people that specialize in trees now at this point uh, but then you have a lot of prop artists uh to to fill the game so that's what i would say uh it's also good because it just learns fundamentals you know, uh, I think every 3D artist starts as a prop artist, you know, like I made a keyboard. Mm -hmm. uh, I made, I don't know, I made a bunch of random stuff when I'm learning, you know, everyone, everyone does. Yeah, we always recommend for, for students that are applying to Nomen and they're like, I want to get into 3D, what should my portfolio have? One of our base things to say, if you want to try it is model your room. Like, what's oh, all good. the stuff yeah. that's in your room? Look around. It's, it's perfect because you have reference. So it's like, I got books, I got you know, keyboards, I got monitors, I got your table, I got your desk, I got your chair. Like all that stuff is perfect to to just try making if you've never made something or if you want to get started is 
reference i think is always really important when you start making stuff like when you're getting started because you can kind of go and if you're like i just want to make something you don't really learn what you're you can make a mistake and i see this happen a lot with people you know in beginners who say well i just wanted to do that because it was the style i wanted or i just wanted it to look that way whereas if you're saying i'm making my keyboard or i'm making this mouse it has to be that thing yeah it's a very different experience yeah you have a metric yes. yeah it's a it's a good point is to be wary about hiding behind style as as an excuse like Style should never come at the end. Like you just make mm -hmm. something, and you go. However, this looks. That's the style. And like that's, yeah, that's yeah. more of a, it's more of a band aid over. You know, it, it's good to be clear with your goals, so that you can measure them. Uh, it's another like, you know, common saying that it, it, you have to measure. You have to be able to measure things to improve. Mm -hmm. So having something as a real world reference is, is a way for us artists to do, to do that. Because mm -hmm. then we have a metric like. Does it look like what I was trying to do? Um, and if not, what are the ways that it would have so that I can be better and learn from it? Absolutely. All right. I feel like I've been dancing around here for a while. I should probably get some teeth in there and go asymmetrical probably. Yeah, I got my I started getting my teeth in just so I could have them to to kind of like uh figure out this mouth shape. I always figure out I always find sculpting mouths is difficult. Uh, as I'm working on mine here, I always find sculpting mouths is difficult yeah. without teeth in there in the same way yeah. that like sculpting eyes without an eyeball in there is yep. basically impossible. Uh, I just made no, a bunch of sure. cubes and I kind of pushed them around and then Perfect. placed them. Perfecto. Just kind of um, something about music. It is a little weird. I, the unfortunately, our uh, software I can share the music, but it will only share when like one of our streams is up. So mm. like it would only share your music or my music. I mean, I guess we could do that. If you want to share music, you can. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I can make it through. Uh, I think if you maybe... play your music, we probably won't hear it though. But you'll. Yeah, I could try that. Let's see. But then, yeah, then it'll be weird, right? Trying to like talk and be like, what? <laughs> as long as it's not too loud. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We had a question. I'm trying to make sure I didn't miss it because I just oh, saw uh, it. Character pipeline was. Yes, question. character pipeline. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know. What was the question? That's I think they're question. just generally curious about the pipeline for characters for games. Well, um you'll you'd make you know get a concept and you make a high poly um that could take uh months mm -hmm. and then uh you make the low poly and then you'll bake it and texture it that's the that's the gist yeah it's what pretty straightforward going, when you're going to get the, the whole whole of it together right it's yeah concept. we can go into the details if you want but I'd, I'd be more specific i mean i literally i literally made a course <laughs> on it that's there you go super long um so i could talk forever about it but depends on what you want to know uh, i'm happy to answer specifics yeah. but uh question the same are you, as props yeah exactly it's kind of the same most game art is kind of the same type of process um are you viewing your reference on another monitor people are asking yeah yeah, yeah so you have a second monitor uh one question we got is what's a tip you can give about posting your work uh, a lot of their images mm -hmm. they're saying seem flat when they compare them to other work. It seems like two questions. Um, posting your work, if you mean like on portfolio or social media, we kind of touched on it before. I don't think that should be anywhere near a priority. Um, I think it should be a byproduct. If you... Um, like if you end up being happy with your thing, like proud of your thing, um, and it's a and it's a true representation of where you're at right now, then go for it. Also, I always get caught up. I mean, maybe everyone's interested in doing things professionally, but I always catch myself because I'm like, I don't, you know, I was generally really interested, genuinely very interested in all this, all these topics. Mm -hmm. So I I wasn't thinking about 
getting a job. And I, I feel like that's shifted. A lot of people think about getting a job. So maybe that's what they're thinking about. Hmm. Um, but yeah, posting work. I mean, like I, I've, I have professional work that I don't post. Um, like you were saying earlier, you know, I've got a lot of stuff on my drive that, that is just for me or failed experiments. So hmm. anyways, that's what I'll say about posting. Social media can have this added pressure and it just really isn't worth it. Um, when you're professional, it does help to do. But if I was, if I was rewinding the clock, uh, but, but keeping it in this era, I don't, I don't think I would post on social media. At least I would try not to, who knows, you know? And then when it comes to, like you said, it being flat, that's a presentation issue. Uh, and presentation is part of the skill set to improve. That's a, that's another hat that we would wear. And uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to get done with the sculpt, but you know, if I don't, then tonight I'll probably mm -hmm. uh, render this. And uh, I'll probably use Arnold. Uh, on my last project, I tried Keyshot again, and I did just just buy Keyshot Ten, so we'll see if that's any better. But you know, whatever. You could also use Blender again, free. Mm -hmm. It's a good ray trace renderer. And then uh, those fundamentals, um, it's like a, it's a it's a whole nother bucket of skills, but something that I'll tell students is, uh, the way I think of it is, um, like you'll take photographers, right? Uh, there's a lot of photographers and there's some really good ones. Uh, and what makes them good? If you think about it, they don't have these 3d skills to overcome. They're masters of fundamentals, like placing a light, choosing a focal length, choosing an F stop, you know, making a composition, playing with background and foreground values, playing with shadows. That's stuff that we can do in 3D with those tools. And so there's a whole skill set that's just in position and values of things. And uh, and you can, you know, presenting your work in a good way, in a strong way, definitely makes a big difference. And so that's something that I think you should be practicing too, to get mileage on. And if it comes out great and you're like really stoked about it, then yeah, by all means share it. But don't don't think you have to share everything. Yeah, don't make that the priority like yeah especially if you're the only only caveat i would give to that is like i'm you know i'm like a beginner and i'm making a portfolio piece right like this is going to be something for my portfolio or you know i'm trying to build to that that to me is the only time and that's not specifically about uh social media but more about presentation and like there's a for me there are certain projects similar to like professional versus personal projects where it's like this is going to be something that i'm going to you know to work on for a really long time and it's going to be something i'm going to try to get hired from or or something like that and i think one thing that i would say to the person who's asking about presentation is is uh ask people like ask send it to the send it to three of your closest art friends and ask them for critique like real critique and if if they send you back looks great and you know that it doesn't look great send it to three other people and maybe don't send to those people again because you want real <laughs> real feedback like you don't want just you know that great job thumbs up all the time from people like that's not how you're going to grow so that's find such a great advice yeah um i do that uh i'm really glad you brought that up i have a core group of people and a lot of them, I want to think, I want to know if it's most of them. I don't know. It's like 50, 50 people that aren't in the, in the business at all. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like, I have a really good friend, longtime friend. I'll show him. I'll just text it to him. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll show my wife and she could, she could care less about stuff. <laughs> so I'll show them and then get their reaction. And yes, yeah, so that's a big part of my process too. Um, also, like, you know, these single day studies this is a little bit of a tangent, but the single day studies um, aren't never going to be as good as, as multi day projects because, like, for me, I like to be able to go to sleep and then wake up and then attack it because it's like so fast to make all these changes, you know, like your brain just gets too used to seeing something. Mm -hmm. But that's that's what you get by showing someone else. You get their first impression and you only get that once. So I'll show, you know, where I'm at to someone and then, uh, and then, you know, later on I'll show someone else and then I'll show them the first person an update. So yeah, that's kind of another big thing in my process is just 
trying to get people's real gut reactions that'll tell me the truth <clears throat> and then tr seeing if I can correct and uh, make it better and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So yeah, that's great advice. And I, I, similar to what you're saying, if it's a multi-day project, uh, what I'll do is I'll take screenshots of it and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll basically make a really large image that can fill my monitor and uh, I go to sleep, but I don't turn my monitor. I don't turn my computer off. I just leave it up on that screen. Uh, you know, maybe I just turn my monitors off or something. And then when I come back, it's the first thing I see, like when I sit down to start mm -hmm. working, it's the first thing I see to kind of give me that, that first impression to, to try yeah. to emulate it. There's no way you can do it because you've already been doing it for a long time, but to kind of emulate that first impression where you sit down and, and knowing that you're going to sit down and say like, okay, I'm going to critique myself. I'm going to evaluate what is wrong with this before I jump in and say, Oh, here it is. I'm going to get back into the project. Where was I at again? Take five, 10 minutes and just evaluate what it is that's wrong or what it is that you want to fix. Mm -hmm. And even like I'll, I sometimes I'll just leave it in Photoshop and I'll just start writing notes or, you know, circling yeah. with red pen and saying like this, these are the things that I need to improve today. This is what I need to fix today or, or, or Absolutely. First. Awesome. Awesome advice. I do similar stuff. I'll, I'll usually leave up the program mm -hmm. so that when I turn my computer on, it's like right where I left it. I'm like, Oh, you know, and I got to face my demons. Mm -hmm. And what you said about doing it in Photoshop, I do that all the time. I think that's a good skill that uh, not everyone does, even though it's simple, but like ripping apart your own work in 2d. Um, and it's, it's faster to do it that way. Uh, and then you can flip back and forth. So what I'll do is I'll do it in Photoshop, right? And then I'll make a make it into a GIF or GIF. <laughs> Some people get mad when I say GIF. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how the comments go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll be like, no, that's okay. not how you say that. That's peanut butter. Yeah, yeah, that's that's peanut butter. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Self critique is such a uh, an important yeah. part. Such an, such an important thing. Uh, somebody just told me to tell you that you're awesome from a friend heart. Oh, well, uh, thank you. You're awesome. It's a Twitch name is Renaud. Renaud Galan. Oh, sick dude. Yeah. He's the lead character artist on Overwatch. Oh, awesome. Hello and Thanks welcome. Thanks for support, homie. <clears throat> it looks like you're getting some of your forms are pretty refined now as far as like the, the, You've got some big creases in there. At least the, the form f seems smooth. At this point, what what's like? What are you looking for when you start adjusting or attacking another area? Um. Yeah, I'd say. Uh, I say I'm still not happy um, with where I'm at. I still don't feel comfortable with the head. So I still feel like I'm kind of getting all of the block out of the main features in there. Okay. Um, like the fun part would be go, getting off asymmetry and starting to get into the, the weeds. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think I just naturally dance around. I'll try to explain my crazy thinking, but I just like, I think I'm often taking a step back. I check the three quarter. That's the, the most telling view that in the side view, you can see my side views crap. Mm -hmm. So people, people often don't including myself don't focus enough on the side views um, and the three quarter. So the, the front, obviously also depending on your reference, it's usually on the front. Okay. So the features I think are getting close to the right position. Um, but then, yeah, the side view still needs work. So I'm often like backing up, making it tiny and going, Oh, that's wrong. That's wrong. And then I'll, I dive in, I work on that a little bit. And so I'm just, I'm just seeing things that feel wrong and I'm dancing around them. Uh, and trying to like, you know, eventually get to a place where it feels better. Uh, so I'm using my instincts, I guess. And it's a mix of, uh, you know, using the likeness. And then also, um, if it just, it just doesn't feel like a head right now, like the neck feels too small mm -hmm. at the base. So there's just things that um, feel wrong from a, from a gut point of view. And I guess just practicing looking it's at heads, like what but, we were just talking about it's like evaluating yourself like yeah. even that little zoom out of like okay I'm, I'm just taking a quick step back you know if we were working in clay or traditional i would you know just kind of take a step back and look at it you know yeah exactly take a walk around go get a drink come back 
I was always the person in studios who would the the chronic person who always walks around like and is yeah. looking at other people's work. That's always yeah, me. Yeah, me too. Because I'll like work for an hour and then I'll do like a lap for fifteen minutes and then I'll come back and work for an hour. And I need I I personally just kind of need that. Yeah. Because I I need to take a little break from what I'm working on so I don't go blind to it. But I also get inspired looking at what other people do. Of you know, Absolutely. hey, like this is really cool what you're doing, or you know, or or giving feedback, or you know, kind of hopefully giving that like that fresh eye to somebody else is also helpful too. Hmm. For sure, I, that's such a I I love doing that. It's also a way for me to meet other people, but then like you know, at a studio, there's just so many talented people, at different disciplines, and like if you're curious about that stuff, you can just walk around. They'll talk to you about it. Yeah. And if you do that enough, you just become known as that person that walks around and then they'll say, Hey man, what's up? And then yeah. you can see, it's interesting. Just see what everyone's working on. So you get to see their daily progress over time and then ask them questions. Yeah. It's another thing. Like when you, when you get to a studio, I think it's just your learning and leveling up can, can go up exponentially because now you have access to all these good people um, mm-hmm. that are good, good at different things. And you can just straight up ask them questions. <laughs> Rather than mm-hmm. try to, you know, Google some obscure thing. Totally. Um, some questions that have popped up recently is they were hoping that you could show your reference again, so they can kind of see what what you're yeah. using. Yeah, maybe I'll um, maybe I'll just have it here too for a little bit. Uh, I think I'll have to not go full screen for this to work. And then I'll get a swig of coffee. It's a good excuse. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Oh, what? Oh, uh, I, I thought T Rush is on top. Hmm. Mode. Here we you go. You just move your sculpt Always over. On top. There you go. There we go. Okay. So getting all that kind of block out. That's a super extreme pose too. So I mean you can kind of see that you're getting the base part of that now. Like you've got kind of his one eye, the mouth mm-hmm. open. So you're at a starting point where if you it's like a yeah it's like the symmetrical basic version so it's kind of a yeah. neutral in between is like my plan I guess mm-hmm. I definitely chose the easier version when I saw yours so I was like I don't know if, I, don't, I don't know if I can do that but... I don't know if I could do it dude <laughs> <laughs> that's the point of a study though that's the point that's the point exactly exactly I'm gonna learn something though for sure for sure maybe what I'll learn is to not choose crazy pose, uh, poses for a stream, for a live stream. <laughs> Where to learn. Definitely, you know, it sounds like you do a lot of streaming as well in videos, I think, right? I do. Uh, I make some YouTube videos. Yeah, I have a YouTube channel. I, I prefer the, you know, I'm, I'm a little sketched uh, about doing things live. Also, things take me a long time. You mm-hmm. know, this is a good a version of something that I do that works mm-hmm. in this format. But also, I don't know if this is entertaining to people. It's pretty pretty monotonous <laughs> i think people like watching live process we got i want to get cool. about 200 people watching right now so oh now see now i'm scared no, I'm just yeah don't worry about it i'm just not gonna tell you the numbers anymore uh you told me so now <laughs> no, i'm just kidding <laughs> different topic what kind of a, a books do you like are there any books that stick out any reference things you like to have home at home that you kind of use like all the time um or well, you like if you're from, into you had interest too so if you're more on like online resources yeah, in terms of saving images, it's uh, for me. I live on on Pinterest. Um, the other reason why I like Pinterest is the algorithm. Hmm. So, like, I look I looked at images for a long time. Obviously, we all do. I had an inspiration folder on my desktop, mm-hmm. but then Pinterest uh, solved something and then uh, enabled some new interesting things for me. Um, Pinterest lets me keep my work, so okay. I can access it from anywhere. So it's in the cloud. Um, and I don't have to take up drive space. And then, you know, I just always have my collection of things I like with me, you know, until, until uh-huh. Pinterest is gone or whatever. But yeah, so I like that it's online. I can share it with people. You know, my boards are public. People can take a look at my own references. So it's public. Uh-huh. And then also there's algorithm. So you click an image that you like and you scroll down and there's endless images. And so what I got, what I got into the, I was excited about the idea of finding images online that aren't so easy to find. Because mm. everybody's going on Google and typing in cyberpunk girl or whatever. Sure. Uh, so if you, you know, I like to just go into the weird corners of the internet and, and find images. So th- in this case, I kind of went against one of my own rules here. 
I just like this expression so much. And I, I didn't think this guy was so recognizable, but sure. this is John Hurt and he's an actor. Mm -hmm. I normally try to choose subjects that aren't well known. I don't want mm -hmm. to, you know, cause I'm not going for likeness. And so uh, I'm gonna, you know, eventually I'm just gonna try to make something look believable enough um, and like their own person. But then, you know, if, if, it, if the original subject is recognizable enough, people will just think, oh yeah, that's a bad likeness, you know, but that's not the goal. So right. I try not to do recognizable people for that reason. So Pinterest is also good at that. Just like there's people on there that look cool um, for one reason or another. And I don't know who they are. Right. That's a little more easy, especially if you're doing, you're saying a study. So, so the, you know, it's not specifically about making John Hurt or I think my yeah. actor is Jackie Earl Haley, right? Like, mm -hmm. but there is also a, a challenge when you're doing these things from what I can tell of trying to make the image versus like the essence yeah. of the image. Yeah. And you know what? It's, it's really like using reference like painters would. Like mm -hmm. I take a lot of images of myself when I do expressions, like a lot of my personal projects have extreme expressions. So I'll use this camera right here and with lighting and everything. And I'll do like weird shit with my face mm -hmm. uh, and I'll take those images. And I, I can also like rotate, you know, to get the expression with multiple angles. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'm not making my own face. I'm just seeing what my face is doing when I'm like trying to do an emotion. And then uh, in the sculpt, that's what's cool about expressions for me is you know, if, if you get them believable enough, uh, it feels like they're more alive and that there's an emotion there. And then from a sculpting point of view, what you're really trying to sell is the physics of the, of the thing of like, this is getting tighter and compressing and like, this is stretching and you know, this muscle's moving this way. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you can, if you can get the physics of it feeling, feeling good enough, um, mm -hmm. then that really sells the expression. I think you don't have to be so like if I tried to trace this perfect, all these little wrinkles, um, mm -hmm. it would either take forever, but I probably wouldn't get it. So really what the goal is going to be is just trying to make it look like skin is bunching here mm -hmm. uh, and then compressing here, you know. Uh, do you have a certain amount of time that you dedicate to your personal projects or is it... Um... Like I know this is like a day study, like you kind of talked about, but yeah. if you're doing something bigger, is it like, do you time box it to say, yeah, this, this is a month or this is a week or a day or something like that? Yeah. I try and, and do that. Um, like I just recently um, did something kind of fast. Um, it was around 15 hours. So I, mm -hmm. I tried to do it in a week. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, I do it in two weeks. Uh, and then sometimes it spills over, but lately that's what I've been trying to do, but that's somewhat recent. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that came from just, you know, projects taking so long. Um, so yeah, I have a, we were talked about it off stream, but I have a, I have a newborn mm -hmm. and, um, that really messes up your schedule. You essentially don't have a schedule right in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And not. then, uh, and so I got itching to go back to art whenever I could. And so once like her schedule started evening out, I tried to build better habits and now we're working from home and, you know, doing art um, for me is a way to just keep balanced and keep moving mm -hmm. forward. So I have a nightly ritual now where I just work for three, three ish hours, three or four hours every mm -hmm. night. Um, and yeah, so it depends on what I'm doing. So those, those hand studies that are on my Instagram, those are one nights. Um, then I have some things that are two weeks. Uh, I'm working on something now. It's probably gonna be like three weeks. So I'm, I'm trying not to go too long though. Mm -hmm. Um, because that's what I do for work. I, I do things that take forever and, and it, it can, you know, can turn into work. I don't want it to be work. So I was I'm just trying ask, to improve yeah. and learn stuff. Like do you choose projects that are you know, personal projects that are specifically different than things you're doing at work or sometimes do you do them? if it's like aligned with work intentionally, like you want to try something different or is, is it just random? You find something interesting or the spark hits and is there yeah, a certain a way question. you pick a project? Um, I think, I think the real answer is, and it sounds easier than it is, but I, I really try to 
follow my interest, like my curiosity at that time mm-hmm. and not overthink it. That's, that's my, one of my problems <laughs> is to overthink things and not do it. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, like the cyberpunk girl that I did, mm-hmm. um, that was just an idea I had. I like the cyberpunk genre. Uh, I've been meaning to do a girl with that kind of attitude, mm-hmm. you know, for a while. And I was just like, hey, cyberpunk's coming out in two weeks. Uh, let's make something and then drop it on that day. Mm-hmm. And then that was it. I could easily overthink that, but I was like, let's just go. So I think a lot of the best decisions in my life end up coming down to being quick. So. That's kind of what it is. Um, but then to your point, though, it naturally comes out to be, like you said, either something I'm struggling with at work, like mm-hmm. something I want to be more confident in. Um, I'll work on that. And sometimes it'll just be very different than work. If I'm working on a sci-fi project, then I'll do a fantasy at home. Mm-hmm. And it just naturally shakes out that way because I've got a lot of different interests. And um, so whatever seems exciting to me at the time, that's the thing about personal work. Again, it, it sounds, maybe it's just me. I don't think it's just me. Uh, some people so. might be better than others, but like finding out what you really want to do, it's so key. And um, it's just harder than it sounds, man. A lot of people are making decisions based on what they think other people think they should do. Mm-hmm. And really trying to get to the core of yourself on like what you want to do and not thinking about, will that lead to success or will that get me a job or will that make people think I'm cool mm-hmm. is really hard. And it, and it gets a little bit easier as I get older, you know, like when I was younger, I thought I just wanted to make things that looked badass that made people think I'm badass, you mm-hmm. know, but I'm not badass, dude. <laughs> so I'm just trying to be genuine with myself, like what I actually like. And I think people pick up on that. Sure. Same thing with YouTube videos. You know, uh, anybody like on TV or people that make music, like if it seems like that person is doing genuinely what they love to do and and they're passionate about it, like, I don't know, there's a truth to it, I guess. And you can pick up on that, I think. So that's what I try to do. I try to be truthful in what I'm doing and not, it comes back to the earlier points. Like, I'm not just trying to do what, you know, other people think are cool. I'm trying to do what I think is cool, whatever Mm -hmm. that is. Just follow your interests and like be do what you like. I think it's good yeah. rather than trying to necessarily say like, you know, this is. I mean, it seems like the the cyberpunk girl was somewhat serendipitous of like you wanted to do a thing, and it, you dropped it on the day, and that's cool. But it wasn't necessarily like I'm going to try to tie in with this thing, you know. For a, you know, I, I see some artists saying like, oh, you know, try to tie in with fan art or social media and try to leverage that, but just kind of doing what you like and yeah i mean i i'll be honest it was definitely that part of the idea i was like i know i see artists doing that too Mm -hmm. and so i i really love the genre and everything and i thought it would be cool to just post it the same day like as a tribute and as a Mm -hmm. as a way to tie it into the release you know also yeah just just to i was excited about it and i thought it'd be natural that's another thing is that can feel like uh that can feel good or bad to me the what we're mentioning like tying into stuff and i just did it actually with with kobe bryant so like kobe Mm -hmm. bryant was a personal hero of mine and i I did a a model Mm -hmm. of him and uh i i haven't been comfortable with doing something like that before you know because i just didn't want to make i didn't want to feel like i'm like trying to capitalize yeah yeah, on another event especially like you know uh, a terrible tragedy like what happened Mm -hmm. but it was something that felt genuine to me i was like i you know i i uh I love basketball. This guy's an inspiration for more than that reason for like his, uh, you know, his work ethic and all this stuff and the mama mentality and stuff like that. So it just mm-hmm. felt natural. And, uh, and it was uh, also these events are ways to time box me, mm. you know, like I can't just spend forever if I have a date. Right. So, and, and they're also experiments. That's part of what I'm learning too this year is like, um, that whole social media thing. I haven't really focused and that's that's been a, an intentional focus uh, this year is to try and see if I can uh, if I can make stuff uh, and share it with people, try to motivate them, uh, share like my process, um, make presentable images, you know, things in a timely manner. Also, just being a three D artist, it's like I thought that's interesting. I see people. 
doing a great job at it. And so I wanted to kind of learn that, mm -hmm. uh, those skills too, is like, how can I learn or how can I figure out how to make uh, nice images at an okay cadence? Because, you know, I don't want to just post an image every two months. So it's a, it's a right. way it's all, it's all holistically adding to the same goals of, of making things that I feel are truthful and doing it at a, at a good enough rate, not being too precious, uh, sharing information with people and then moving on. All right, let's just get off. What is this? 1147. Ooh. All right, dude. Yeah, like 115 left. Yeah. <laughs> let's, um, let's just go off script now, dude. Let's just do it. Let's just do it. So you're going off symmetry or what do you, what yep. are you thinking? Okay, yep. here we go. Yep. Let's just go, dude. Um, I think also it's a good tip. I'm going to, hello. Oh, you got to get to the center. I never know how to use this thing. Oh, that thing? Yeah, I'm using it now. So I'm doing it. I lied. I use the action line still or the transpose line too. quite a bit. Yeah, I do too. I do too. So I guess these eyes are actually big, turns out. Yeah, that looks awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's turn symmetry on and then. Yeah, I still do too, but I use that uh, whatever that thing's called, that gizmo, because um, it has a like it has like a center thing. Mm -hmm. So I just used it for that reason. So here's another nice tip that I do for myself that might help some people. You know, because we're jumping off the bridge now, I'll mm -hmm. just save it as an I'll just add a number, dude, and then there you go, safety net, no yeah. problem. Always good to have those. <laughs> yeah, no problem now. See. Actually, let's do this first. So when you start going asymmetrical, it's kind of, it is very much like just a leap. Because it's basically yeah. like you're starting a whole new, you're creating entirely new forms off of obviously what was there, but. Yeah. Just moving it around. And then, uh, yeah, and then the next phase is going to be trying to sort that out. Because mm -hmm. it's also just going to, you know, it's going to twist everything. Also, the jaw is going to rotate. So, yeah, we're going to go just fully off script here. Yeah, I mean, that when right before when you showed me your photo, your reference photo, I was like, that is an extreme pose. That'll be, that's a cool one, though. <laughs> I love that photo. Yeah, it's, I, I love this photo, too. I, I, you can tell I really like it when I see in my Pinterest board that I have it twice. <laughs> yeah, you like so it. I was like, oh, I, I, yeah, I, I forgot I had it and I got it again. So, that, that's a good sign. It's coming back, yeah. Yeah, and also with these extreme poses, it's like, you know, if you don't get it right, it should still be kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. For those of you who are looking and watching and saying like, that's maybe a little too much, you can look at what I'm doing, which is a little more straightforward. So I'm just kind of going, I found a more uh, reference photo of, of a less dynamic, very not very not very dynamic pose, but just kind of uh, following along and trying to use like sort of a likeness and study and try to get a little bit of the emotion of, of what this character is kind of putting across. So uh, if you're watching and thinking like maybe you it's a little too far, uh, you can obviously dial it back and just use it as just a general head study. You don't have to go super crazy like like Jay is because I think that's awesome seeing the extreme that you're going to go to and I think you're already even just bouncing back right now you can see that you're getting you're yeah, getting it's it interesting. there <laughs> it's no like it, it has a lot of emotion in it right now I think it's working yeah let's see um, 
Yeah, and I think over time, you know, I'm just up in the stakes. Um, mm -hmm. Just, you know, if I fail, I fail farther, but that's fine. I mean, it's it's good. Because then if you land it, it's like fun, you know? Uh, also, cool. what you're doing, by the way, I just wanted to say, subtlety is not necessarily easier. We, we know that by, you know, trying to do a nice uh, female model, which has mm. a lot less room for contrast in forms. You got to be a lot more subtle. So that's why when I saw the one you're doing, like, the subtle difference in the eyes, the eye position, the fact that they're rotated off center, the fact that he has a, a neck tilt and a head tilt. Those are important. If you get those, it's the difference between someone looking like a, like a robot turned off and mm -hmm. looking alive. And that's the goal is to learn and then end up with something that looks alive, hopefully. And if we fail, that's fine. We can get better at it. But that's what I think character art mm -hmm. is about. Well, that's subtlety. A lot of what you know i think there's all the flashy stuff on the surface but it's kind of getting to the the more subtle things that people don't necessarily recognize at the first glance and that kind of sum of parts really adding to the character it's, it's a as like i don't know about you but as, as i work more on like on a longer form projects or stuff like that mm -hmm. you i feel like i learn more over time about like the the little details, the importance of all the little tiny details. And I don't mean details like like pores. I mean details like like exactly the things you're saying, like just the subtlety of all these little things ending up really making it from like, like I love your analogy of a robot being turned off to like a, a human that is yeah. you know, emoting. And for me, I think that's the most exciting. That's that's the thing. Uh, you know, speaking a little bit about a bit like introspection and mm -hmm. and trying to be truthful and figure out why you're doing stuff um, is has been a part of of my journey. I guess is always trying to stay centered about that stuff. Remind my myself because things have been changing. Like I said, I mean, I went to college before I even knew what ZBrush was, and I, I can't imagine why. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it must have been that I was uh, interested in it, and I couldn't see myself getting like a real job and going to a real school. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, for me, um, I often um, relate the experience of seeing Golem for the first time as the oh, yeah. impetus of, of why I do what I do and became like a, an obsession of learning like how it was done and everything about it just because that magic trick that happened. And a lot of people quote Jurassic Park for the same reason. Sure. Uh, and that's that's the thing that still excites me today is when something that's not real looks real and looks alive, that, mm -hmm. that magic of that is um, the spark that still excites me so when i do even when i do these studies that's what i'm grasping for is can i can i do something even on a small scale that could for a moment feel like um it's alive and trigger that that feeling when you see it uh, speaking of inspirations so Gollum is one of the big ones are there other movies yeah. or, or is Gollum like the one or what are, what are some of like your things that you that you love from that same point Golem is the one for me. Um, if I were to say the one thing, Jurassic Park, I'll also say this. I mean, you know, to get really personal with it, I think, and I think this is true of a lot of sons, I think my father, even if inadvertently, um, you know, shaped my motivations. Um, you can see an alien poster behind me. Okay, he yeah. showed me, um, so my dad's like 75 years old or something now, um, which is a little bit unconventional because I'm 30. Two or 33 or something so he's uh he was older you know older guy when he had me and uh he was like a math teacher he you know he's retired now he was a math teacher and uh i don't know he just in retrospect it's like he's a geek but he didn't you know he like he know. showed me or yeah but, but yeah he like he took me to frankensons yeah. uh uh he collected comic books he showed me uh he showed me Alien and Aliens. He showed me Terminator and Terminator 2. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he showed me the die. And this is like, he's not on the internet. He bought me a computer when I was five. Like mm -hmm. he's just naturally interested in this stuff. And then <clears throat> he shared that with me. Mm -hmm. And there was no pressure, but I think I just grew up um, with those influences, Lucky, because it's a little bit out of my age group, like seeing Alien and Aliens and Predator, you know, when yeah. you're 10. Not I'm everyone you, my though, age. Yeah. yeah. I think they're hugely influential. And then he still tells the story today of like when he saw Jurassic Park and when he saw Terminator 2 in theaters and the 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 crazy experience he had 
and then coming home and telling my mom, you know, you got to come see this. And he would go back to the theater and watch it that day. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> so he just it genuinely gets joy from that stuff. And um, so sometimes I think I grew up in that world and I wanted to create that emotion for people like, mm. um, like someone who is in awe of a magician Yes. And then I wanted to learn how the tricks are done and I wanted to do them. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's kind of what it is. I'm just obsessed with learning about all that stuff. Now I love like, uh, yeah. So yeah, I think of like abyss as one of the first. Oh, I love the abyss. In, oh, amazing. It's a great movie. Great movie. Uh, first movie to ever use Photoshop. They like invented Photoshop to make the cube maps mm -hmm. for that movie for the reflections of the water worm monster. Yep. Terminator two. Uh, there's actually that guy, uh, Mike Hill. He actually did a whole talk on this now about how Terminator Two is like the movie that that you know popularized uh, the way digital effects are done. Even T one thousand, yeah, you got it. Like yeah, it's, it was the first time that I think people really saw that there were there were other types of characters out there that were not the traditional monster, right? The the monster, even Terminator One, which is a great film, I love it. Uh, yeah. But it's it's one of the first times where people were like, oh, okay, um, there's other there's other things out there. There's other possibilities out there, and I think that was the one that like ignited other filmmakers, other creators to try and do different things rather than just a man in a suit of some kind. Yeah, a digital character, uh, a blend of the of the Stan Winston effects mm -hmm. and the CG, the guy coming up from the floor. Just really creative ways, like, you know, um, I mean, it's really interesting to think about it that, so in Abyss, they figure out reflections and they use cube maps. Uh, and then that becomes Liquid Metal Man, who's just 100% reflective, you know? And you can just see how, like, with their limitations, they still maximized yeah. the awesomeness, <laughs> the, like, making a character, making a story around that. Well, it's like you yeah, can see so James Cameron's like thought process. It's like, I want to do a metal man, I think, for the next version. But I don't know how. So what if yeah. I make another film where we make a water creature? Yeah. We'll see if we can if that can be successful. And if that's successful, then we'll do the T-1000. If not, we'll do something different. Like It's almost like I yeah. feel like there was like a master plan there. for Absolutely, absolutely. I, I'm a huge James Cameron fan. So yeah, mm -hmm. I think you asked influences or whatever. I think, yeah, probably my favorite director. I mean, Peter Jackson too, for what he did on Lord sure. of the Rings. Sure. And, yeah. and even more so, um, is another thing, if anyone's interested in getting super nerdy for a second. Um, Let's do it. You know, I, I love movies uh, like we're talking about. Obviously, I think a lot of us do. And uh, and I feel like I'm a student of this stuff or, or at least an, an extremely passionate um, person, like interested mm -hmm. in, in the ins and outs. So obviously being really into movies, my dad, again, influence, he had a huge DVD collection. Hmm. And I think the Lord of the Rings, my favorite movies probably um, for the place they have in my heart when, you know, they're, they're like my Star Wars. Hmm. Uh, it was the most magical theatrical experience that I had. And uh, it also introduced me to fantasy. And then it, it was the first time that I had ever seen something so fantastical done so seriously. Mm -hmm. I think that was the mixture that blew my mind. And, uh, and that's my favorite kind of entertainment is like escapism stuff, just yeah. feeling like I'm in somewhere else. And, um, so that thing is epic. It holds a place in my heart for those reasons. And then on top of that, I think it's the best home DVD you can get. Um, but the making so of? I used to, yeah, the making ofs and they yeah. have, they have a commentary track. They have multiple commentary tracks. They've got one of the actors. They've got one mm -hmm. of the director they've got one in the cinematographer uh so uh, i used to have this long commute to college mm -hmm. it was like uh a little bit more than an hour and then uh I, I thought i was super cool i don't know if you guys know there was a show called pit my ride so i had this <laughs> truck and i bought this like dvd player head unit yep. and i just had the lord of the rings dvds in my truck and so it would just be on loop so i would just be watching the like first i would watch all the behind the scenes there's like six or seven hours for each movie yeah and uh and the attitude that all those people had the spirit and the work ethic but like maintaining this good attitude I, they're just a really big inspiration that moment in time of them mm -hmm. working on and like i think it really made a big influence on me on how they just they were hard working crazy goals 
but maintained a positive, upbeat attitude and a collaborative environment. It's just a really like magic struck to make those movies. And just coincidentally, they were filming the biggest behind the scenes I've ever seen. Yeah. You know, I wish I wish there was a behind the scenes like that for every one of my favorite movies, but it just so happens that that it exists. So, anyways, I recommend that to anyone who's interested. I put those on. You asked what I would what I'll work to. Mm-hmm. That's a classic one. So maybe yeah, I'll put that certain, on in the background. There's certain movies that I can work that I can watch too that I probably watched a thousand I, that's maybe an exaggeration yeah. but a thousand times it feels like i've probably watched yeah. like 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 a lot of the a lot of the same things you're talking about i have just a folder of of movies that i have you know found at some point or gotten of of things i can just watch and put on alien aliens is definitely in yeah. there predator one not so much two terminator one yeah. two definitely um uh, another kind of big series not series but was uh, the Paul Verhoeven movies for me, which is mm. RoboCop, oh, yeah. um, cool. Total Recall, and Starship Troopers. I love all three of those movies, and I can watch those over and over and over and over and over. Yeah, I love that. And the the, the director commentaries, like that's something that I, I think it's I don't know maybe it's a small crowd that watches those, but I love them. I will I can oh, watch yeah. director commentaries, behind the scenes commentaries over and over and over. Oh yeah, I think it's great to do for what we do too. Like working, um, like I I you know I try to I try to the whole having something on in the background. I try to keep it as a treat because like I said, to get it drastically reduces my productivity. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I I kind of use it as like if I get two hours of focused work then I can put something on and get another couple hours of like not so focused work, you know, so sure, I'm still yeah. making some progress. <laughs> like tears um, of quality of your yeah, work. Yeah. Yeah. And it's late at night, you know, I'm just going to put this on. And I also think it's a benefit if it's something I've seen before, if it's something I've never seen before, I can't focus, you know, if I like it, I'm just like, Oh, I want to see this. But yeah, all of a sudden you just find yourself like doing this and you're like watching your, and you're like, Oh yeah, I was doing something. That's right. Like, oops, yeah. right. Deadline or whatever else I was trying to do. Yeah. So I think commentaries are great for that too, because it's like a podcast. Now podcasts are huge, right? So I mean, we were into it. We were we were the hipsters where we were just listening to people talk <laughs> for hours. It's actually better than a podcast because you know you'll hear a cool story, like an anecdote of like, oh, right here, this guy did this, or I used this camera, and like we actually did this on set, and then I can look and go, oh, cool, you know, and mm-hmm. I see what they're talking about. But um, yeah, I love uh, commentaries and stuff, and yeah, dude. I just got the Lord of the Rings in 4K. Just came out. Oh man! So. We do. Uh, we, my wife and I, we watch movies all the time, and so we try to save like certain movies for certain times of the year to do a marathon. So we, oh, nice. we do the Star Wars marathon, the Marvel thing marathon, the Harry Potter marathon, the Lord of the Rings marathon, the, all of these right. different. So like different parts of the year, different ones, and usually uh, Christmas is Lord of the Rings. So we we had oh, just nice. kind of gone through that one. Sick, dude. Uh, sounds like I would get along with you guys. <laughs> Looks like you're kind of getting in some wrinkly forms now. Yeah, why not? I thought, hey, let's let's start to do some some compression, see what's going on. Um, I'm gonna keep dancing around, but it's just a way of like entertaining myself and just saying like, hey, this might be cool to try and figure out right now, you know. So you can see I just switched gears to like you mentioned it and I was like, oh, let me take a step back and I noticed some other stuff. So there's a, always a million things to do. Uh, also, uh, I got to do I was going to ask you about uh, hair, like eyebrows. And I, I don't know if you're going mm-hmm. for the mustache vibe or any of that stuff, but how, how soon do you start doing that? Is that an early thing or a late thing if you're going to do it? Oh, if I'm going to do it, it's a late thing. And that's because... Um, things can change. Uh, and that's, that's an example of something that would have a knock on effect. Mm-hmm. Like if I were to change the eyebrows, now all of a sudden I got to change the hair. So it's, it's usually at the end. Um, yeah. And, and ZBrush has its quirks with the, with fiber mesh. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it just, it would be towards the end. Uh, it, you know, if I was sculpting the hair, you know, maybe we'll do that since we don't have time. Maybe I'll just uh, do a quick sketch of the hair, and then uh, and then I don't mind shifting that around because then it, it can be treated just like a model, you know. 
so maybe that's what I'll do. We'll see. Because the mustache is pretty dope. The mustache and the eyebrow is, is pretty. There's a ton cool. of personality to that for sure, yeah. Yeah. So maybe I'll do that here real quick. All right. I think I'm at a decent like default pose for mine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm going to break symmetry and just probably sculpt without it from now on. Let's do it, dude. So you already jumped in way ahead of me, but I'm feeling like I'm I'm pretty close with this thing. And there's never really a right moment, you know, just yeah. jump in, jump in. See what happens. See what happens. Using the the stream preview to kind of look at a much smaller version of it, which is kind of nice. <laughs> Pack. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like nice. the navigator in Photoshop. Sometimes I'll just put that yeah. in another window. Yeah, me too. Uh, general hardware question. People are asking what kind of yeah. hardware do you use? I think I saw uh, right you on a Yeah, right now I'm on a 2017 iMac Pro, which, uh, which is not too beefy nowadays, unfortunately. Um, it's still pretty good, but I'm super jealous about the, um, like the, the, um, progression of, um, RTX. Every, mm. Everybody, uh, uh, supports RTX now. Their, yeah. um, whatever that shit's called, the, that can get hardware accelerated mm -hmm. and you can get these NVIDIA cards that are sick. So we'll see. Um, I'm okay for now, but, but I only have 10 cores and all I'm limited to to core like rendering. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to renders, my renders take a while and it'd be nice to get some GPU acceleration. So that might be on the horizon. But uh as of right now I just use uh I, I like Mac OS, so I'm, I use it as much as I can. And when it comes to sculpting and doing pretty much everything other than uh rendering, mm -hmm. uh it's fine. So yeah, that's what I'm on right now. Thanks. Yeah, they were wondering how you were working on an iMac, or I think somebody said, it, "How is it running on a MacBook?" Because I think they saw your your oh, uh, yeah. software. Yeah, it's running on an iMac uh, Pro, the 2017 one. I know there's some rumors. I'm I'm gonna try to hold out a year and see. There's some rumors of a more more affordable Mac Pro, and they're working on their own chips. Mm, I don't the know. M1 we'll chips, see. the M2 chips. Yeah. yeah. And they're the new MacBooks are getting insane like um, yeah. tests, um, but still there's like this legal problem with not using NVIDIA, not supporting NVIDIA. So is it called CUDA? It's like I can't. I think that's what it is. I don't know. But yeah, I think I can't use that. the thing. Ah. Can't use the thing that all the cool kids are using. So I'm jealous right now. So I might I might end up getting two boxes and trying the whole KVM switch thing. Mm -hmm. We'll see. I mean, it would be cool to have two computers, honestly, just so I could like have one do render. I, I know that's what uh, Ash Thorpe is it? Ash Thorpe has that. I think it's Ash. But uh, yeah, I always thought when I heard that, I was like, "That's baller." You know, maybe that's some goals one day having two. Best of both worlds. Yeah, Nvidia has the CUDA cores. Is what uh, somebody from Twitch was saying. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so that's that's what's cool. Like the new Marmoset, the new Substance Painter, Arnold. Everybody supports that to get hardware acceleration, all the denoisers. So in the last three years, I've it's been developed so crazy that now I've got this crazy FOMO. And they just came out with these cards that are yeah. even faster. Like so yeah, like my Cyberpunk girl, as an example, mm -hmm. um, took like around four hours of frame, four or five hours of frame to render. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a guy on YouTube that put the new NVIDIA card in and he, he rendered a 4K thing in like a couple minutes. Like it's a crazy, <laughs> crazy difference. Right. I was well, like, what? All right. Yeah. I was like, damn. I love Arnold. It's my favorite renderer. The sure. only downside is how long it takes. Right. It is a little, yeah. little long. I love it. It looks so good, I think. Is that it, what? Yeah. I was going to ask you, what's the, re what's the reason you choose Arnold over any of the V-Ray Redshift, anything else? Yeah, it just looks so physical to me. It just looks physically right. Um, like, I mean, I love Keyshot's convenience, but for mm. me, Keyshot always looks uh, fake. It just doesn't look like it's physically doing it. Um, honestly, I, I'm going to practice some more in um, Cycles, the Blender renderer, because it also looks pretty good. Yeah. I don't know if it's going to be much faster than Arnold. Uh, also, Redshift, they're they're coming out with one that that works on my GPU. 
So okay. I'm going to try that. I, the Octane just did that. So I tried Octane. Mm -hmm. But um, Octane doesn't have a good skin and hair shader. And that's kind of, that's another reason why I love Arnold. Arnold has the best skin and hair shader that I've ever used. They use it in movies for digital doubles. So you literally can't do any better. And you just drop it on there and it looks good. So Pretty easy to use and it's great. Yeah, it's integrated into Maya, which is my main, you know, modeler. Mm -hmm. So, have you ever used it. other modelers? I mean, it sounds like you obviously use Blender, but like Max, Moto, anything else? I used Max um, on Evolve because that's what the studio had, but I hadn't really used it. I actually in, in school I was a wise ass, and I was like, in all the Max classes, I just used Maya, and I just. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Maya's the future, guys. Yeah, we should be doing not going to use Max. And then when I got my job, it was in Max. I was like, oh. <laughs> so I just uh, I just found the best Max modeler, and I sat next to them. Yeah, that's a good idea. I, I'm kind of the opposite. I actually I went to school before I went to Noman, and uh, they taught Max. And so I learned Max there. And then I came to, to Noman, and they were like, oh, we only teach Maya here. And I was like, oh, I'm going to do all my work in Max. <laughs> and then I, I didn't realize that this, the progression of, of the courses at Noman only teach Maya. So mm -hmm. the first class was just like an intro to Maya. And so I had basically put myself in a really bad position because I had skipped over the intro to Maya class, basically. Oh, yeah. Max. And then it was like, all right, now we're going to teach you how to light and how to render and how to do all these other things. And I was like, oh, no, like, I've really messed up. So I, I basically uninstalled, like I intentionally uninstalled Max because I kept going back to it. Smart. And so I just like forced myself to learn it. Once you learn like one software, learning another one, it's obviously hard, but it's it's not as hard once you kind of go through that process like a couple times I've found. Yeah, it's true. Uh, I've been putting off learning Blender just because it's so much new stuff. Mm. Um, and I like, you know, the other thing is, I think this is true of a lot of people, um, you know, that are, that are making, that are, you know, just getting a habit of making stuff uh, and staying productive is something. Mm -hmm. And then to spend your time failing again and, and not knowing what's going on and not being able to make what you want to make is a, uh, can be a can be a challenge you know when you sit down at night it's like do i want to make something new right now or do i want to figure out this new software it's hard to yeah it's like it's i kind of want to zen out and sacrifice. make some work sometimes rather than learn you know how a new software works or something like that yeah, yeah. precisely I like all the compression wrinkles like in his uh forehead cool Actually, I can even use a um, pinch brush, little hack right here. I'll fix that. Oh, uh, the pinch brush. I think I saw one of your YouTube videos where you're using the pinch brush, and I was like, I don't use it as much as I should. Like, I used to use it all the time. Right? Super good for the compression-y wrinkles. And, like, I use it all the time to, f to fix, like, lines. See, these lines are all wonky. Mm -hmm. So I can just, like, try to even out the... I've got a question from Twitch, and uh, I, I can answer this. Maybe you can, but cool. have you used any of the dynamic or cloth brushes to nudge skin wrinkles? No. I've tried it once on like a creature, and it actually works really well uh, oh, cool. to get like gross, wrinkly creature skin. Uh, but you do have to work with it on a little bit of a lower subdivision level because okay. it can't handle the dynamics at a high level. Oh, oh, high gotcha. level. So. So you can get like the base forms of it in, but you can't do it on the, but it is, it is really good for that. So I think it's like the cloth nudge brush or something like that. One of those brushes is, is great. I did that. just try that on my latest project, uh, cloth brush for the first time. And I, I think, I think I could get it to work if I played with it some more. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, I was noticing like I could get better results by changing the dynamic mm -hmm. stuff, like the, whatever the, and the self collision yeah th yeah these things yeah firmness and stuff i guess i don't know uh definitely better than um marvelous to me that was marvelous is a chore to me i try to just sculpt all my all my cloth now just because it yeah I'm, I'm not very good at that program and when i even when i got the results i wanted to it took me a week and, mm. and i was just getting a base mesh you know and i was like dude a week for the base mesh like i don't know like <laughs> I don't know if it's worth it. So I've I've met I've worked with some people that are really good at it, mm -hmm. which I think is awesome. Oh, funny. 
I can't I've uh, seen some like uh, wizards in it. Yeah, and that's really cool. Like, it looks great, but uh, yeah, just I don't know, man. It sucks. I, I, it's like frustrating to use. I don't know if you used it, but if, it feels like trying to set up a tent in the wind. And it keeps knocking it down and you're like shit and you put it back up and then it knocks it down again and i'm like oh my god i don't think i've got the temperament for this dude <laughs> it's like why isn't this working sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't work yeah uh, even when you like it and you're like yeah this looks good and then it's like you know and it's like okay now you got to get it over to zbrush now you got to get it out out and sculpt on it yeah that that's like what i look forward to i was like let's just let's just get to zbrush you know what i mean let's just get to zbrush I'm assuming your favorite part of the process is of all art, you know, game art and character artist sculpting. Or do you have another part that probably, you probably, I love texturing too. Now I yeah. love texturing too. Um, I spend the most time in ZBrush. You know, we spoke earlier about, I think that was, that became my focus. You know, I just thought if I, you know, if you make a good high poly, everything else, it's easier. Um, mm -hmm. And then I, I became, you know, I got more and more interested in um, texturing over time. And then now with Substance Painter, it's so cool. And then getting, you know, getting a nice render. I don't know. I can find something to like about every process. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't like topology. Uh, so in my, in my personal work, I don't do that stuff. I just do the fun stuff. But yeah, mm -hmm. I love texturing too, but probably sculpting which i think of as an extension of modeling you know like a, another you know personal um influence in me i guess i would say or someone i look up to and relate to is adam savage mm -hmm. you know he's got a, a youtube channel too and um he's just a very passionate maker guy who has all these interests all over the place so i relate to him in that way and also like i feel like that might be me if it wasn't for my dad gave me a, com a computer when i was five but obviously shop. when you do yeah, obviously when you do uh, characters, a lot of it is what I'm doing now, but then also like hair is a different thing. Modeling the costume is a different thing. Modeling the the jewelry or the gadgets or the, you know? So it, it's kind of a holistic thing. And at the end you have a model. So I can just geek out on that. Just having a 3D model of the thing mm -hmm. is kind of the ultimate goal. But yeah, I spend a lot of time in ZBrush and I do enjoy spending time in ZBrush. It's I'm the most com I'm the most comfortable in ZBrush for sure. Uh, question from Twitch that's popped up a couple times: Have mm -hmm. you used Maverick Studio at all? I don't. I've never used Maverick Studio. I've never heard of it. I've never heard of it either. So we have not used it, and I, neither of us have ever heard of it. Uh, let us know what it is, I guess. Yeah. Um, so yeah, somebody's commenting saying that texturing and modeling that they feel like they're kind of converging into like the same. Uh, no, uh, I kind of know what you're talking about, but no, I think they're still going to always play a, um, a role with each other. I don't think they're ever going to be actually the same thing, but I assume what's, what he's referring to is like, uh, you know, there's some people that are, that are doing such extreme things in substance designer that it's like modeling, which is, which is true. People are doing that. That's not necessarily a production thing, but I think they are like texturing influences the model a lot more now, like with displacement mm -hmm. and adding detail. You know, if you're doing sci fi stuff, you know, you wouldn't want to have to model all that detail anymore. You're just going to do it in the texture. Why not? But I, I think you'll, I don't think you'll ever not be modeling. So right. they're, they're just both getting better, I guess. Yeah, I think the, the power of texturing, especially with, you know, displacement, displacement mass becoming more, more and more popular, even in, you know, some game environments, uh, obviously like, you know, tessellations and stuff like that is cool. Uh, I, th I think that's just gonna be more and more popular. Like I think texturing is just like you're saying, adding to the modeling process, but I don't think it's ever going to really replace it or, it, or it yeah. informs how you're going to do it differently. Like I remember doing, you know, clothing and cloth, cloth sculpts and going down to putting the, the texture information and the cloth pattern into the, the sculpt. Like that was something I used to do a long time yeah. ago. And now that's something that I would never do because I yeah. would just texture it that way to make it have the, the right yeah. feelings. Exactly. Precisely. My boy. 
sounds like uh, Maverick Studio is key shot, but cheaper. Oh. Uh, well, the only reason I use Keyshot is because of the ZBrush bridge. Yeah, that's true. So if Maverick has that, that's cool, but I doubt it does. So I wouldn't use Keyshot if it wasn't for the bridge. Yeah, the bridge is and great. And the reason why, yeah, the reason why I like the bridge is like, like on my last project, the Kobe project, I did the hair and fiber mesh, which is a, a faster, more direct solution for some hair. And then I can just move that over to Keyshot. Um, I like doing, I like, you know, I, Hair is an important part of characters, and uh, I didn't have a solution for that for a long time. X-Gen became that solution, and I do love X-Gen, mm -hmm. um, but I'm still not at a place where it's fast. Mm. So I, I pick and choose, like, you know, Wait, what I'm doing. Good. Yeah, if it's going to be a longer project, um, then yeah. And, I'm, and, I'm, and I want to get better at, at being fast. But even, like, you know, X-Gen is used professionally, and... Uh, you know, actual groom artists, it's their full-time job for a long time. So it's not like it's ever going to be super fast, but I'm trying to come up with, you know, ways that I can do it. All right, let's get a mustache on here. Why don't we? Yeah, there you go. Speaking of hair, are you going to sculpt it or are you going to fiber mesh it? I mean, let's see, where are we at? 12.23? Let's do a 10-minute um, fiber mesh version, and then we'll see if it, uh, if it looks cool. Because right. I can always do a quick sketchy thing, if not. So it looks like you're maybe just talk us through the process as you go. You're masking out the location for where you're going to put the, the base fibers, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then um, same with X-Gen. A little tip is to um, do more then you want then you might need mm. because you can delete the hairs but you can't add hairs so it's always uh, like really helpful for eyebrows mm -hmm. too many times have i gotten to a spot where i didn't have enough hair for eyebrows so yeah then i'm going to blur it a little bit and then we're going to go to fiber mesh i'm going to open up a base that i have actually this is on my online stores you can get this for free if you care uh, not very many people do fiber mesh though but i mm. saved my little presets mm. cool if you want to use them you can just to get you up and running this might not be the right settings because when we started with our mesh it was very small mm -hmm. so, so i'll do another thing here let's just make sure Just make sure this doesn't crash. I'm going to do a render so that oh, what? Hello? Oh, did it save it? Interesting. Oh, oh wait, what's going on? Maybe it didn't. Um, I've not done that before. Maybe when I loaded it. Okay, now I gotta load again. Splash, fiber mesh. Okay. All right. So yeah, the thing about fiber mesh is it doesn't show you what it is until you do a BPR render, ZBrush's render. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I'm gonna see the size and everything. Maybe need to make it bigger or smaller. Let's see. Okay, well that's a lot of hair. That's for sure. Very dense. Yeah, that's a dense mustache. Um, yeah, so I think bigger and then a uh, question while you're working that out, uh, any video games you're looking forward to this year and what are some of your favorite games to play when you have time? Of course. Yeah, honestly, I don't play that many games anymore. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, in college, there's this professor who was like, make games, play games and have a life. Choose two. <laughs> and I was like, ah, and then here I am. Yeah, right. Uh, so I don't play games that much. Um, but the big influences on me were like Counter Strike, Call of Duty. I, I still used to play uh, Warzone mm -hmm. uh, for a couple hours a night with my friends. It was a good way to hang out, you know, especially during quarantine. Oh, totally. Yeah. Um, so I, I still make time to do that occasionally now. Um, so I'm kind of like I'm kind of a, a old school. Uh, what do they call it? Casual gamer. Now I'd like to sit on my couch and uh, eat snacks and get pwned by 
15 year olds in Warzone. So I guess I'm that guy now. So Warzone, yeah. Yeah, Warzone. Um, there's some games that like Cyberpunk I, I stayed away from hmm. just because I thought it would take a long time. A big big version of that is like I love Western, I love the Western genre. Mm-hmm. And I thought Red Dead Two was gonna, like going to be a masterpiece, but I didn't get it just because I was like, "Dude, that's gonna be hundreds of hours." I was like, "If I just spend a hundred hours on a personal project, I'd be a lot happier with myself." <laughs> let's just say, accept. Let's just let's just commit. Let's just commit. All right. So. I don't know about for me for this year. Uh, Cyberpunk was definitely one that I played uh, and got into that stuff. I like a lot of strategy games. So like things that are like Crusader King mm-hmm. 3, which some people don't really know what that is, but it's a mm. super uh, high-level strategy game where you basically like uh, oversee a dynasty over like many lineages, which is interesting. So it's like the, t- the time travels very differently. Um, but I don't know about this year. I don't know if there's any specific games that I'm looking forward to this year. Uh, yeah, I don't know what all games come out all the time. Um, my game Back for Blood probably come out this year, so I'll just say that. Shameless plug. <laughs> Is there a trailer or anything we can watch about it? Yeah, there's a cinematic trailer and a gameplay trailer on on the cool. YouTubes. Uh, if you guys want to check it out, awesome. Check it out after the stream. Cool. Uh, what kind yeah, of game it's is like it? A zombie. It's a zombie shooter game. Oh, nice. Very turtle rock and exactly like Left for Dead style. I'm not. I don't know if it is yep. that style, but yep, it is. Nice. Definitely. Left for Dead style. And how long have you been at Turtle Rock now? So I uh, I was there for almost five years when we were working on Evolve. I got there kind of early. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. I was employee number like 20 or something like that. And then, um, yeah, I was on that for a long time. And then we shipped it and then it slowed down. And then uh, I went to go join my friend over at Respawn. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I was there for two years. On Apex. Uh, yeah, Titanfall 2 first, and, okay. then, uh, and then Apex. Cool. Yeah, and then I went back to Turtle Rock, and now I've been there probably for another two years. Nice. Yeah. All right, let's see. What does this look like? Well, first, let's maybe get a couple clumps in here. Let's do... Pinch Brush again, making an appearance. <laughs> Uh, Might as well even group group masked. Uh, question from Twitch: Is there self collision on the hairs, or do they kind of no. just pass through each other? Yeah, they just pass through each other. Yeah, it's a really basic uh, hair fibery system, um, but it work. It can work cool for sketches, you oh. know. Um, I'm gonna delete some right now. It gets. It looks like it's getting a little bit. Um, full here. Like I said, group masked. Yeah, it's um, not that complicated. Okay, let's just uh, throw some turbulence on here and just do a render and see. See what we can see. Maybe it's cool. Maybe it's not. 
Who knows? <laughs> That's part of the test, though, right? You got to try it out mm-hmm. and see what it looks like. Mm-hmm. Little Salvador Dolly vibes. Yeah, definitely a little bit of that. Mm. No, it looks like a dog. Like a <laughs> shih tzu hair. Yeah, um, it's a little. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because of like how trimmed it is. It's like a perfect line. Mm-hmm. And it's it's just little, like, uh, is it so like wild and wiry? Yeah, exactly. That's what's cool. Um, groom hair toss? What? I don't know. Oh, that's a weird brush. Yeah, but, super weird. Oh, this is all weird. All these groom brushes are kind of crazy. It definitely takes a little while to get used to what those do. Yeah. Um, let's do this. Well, while Jay Hill's working on that, I'm going to just pop over some yeah, slowly. Yeah, check it out. Slowly getting some of this symmetry, not extreme amounts, but just a little kind of twist. I don't know if I got enough in there, but it's some little bits. Yeah. A little bit. It looks, I mean, it looks more natural already. Just by It looks that. more natural for sure. I, I think maybe I could push a little further to... Uh, you can always go further. Trying to portray that. But it helps a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I was debating. He has all this stubble. Like I was kind of just putting these little pock marks on the skin, which is kind of effective for just breaking the surface up. About like, I don't know, like getting a bunch of stubble in there. I could either do it as hair. I could just texture it. But I feel like I want to get some of that actual surface quality in. So I don't have like a good yeah. plan for that just yet. Aside from fiber some... mesh. Ah, to do like the stubble? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe just having a little scatter spray and then mm. a little pointy alpha. That might work. I'll give that just a shot. Let it, just let it do it. Oh, ADD. <laughs> That's around. Yeah. Do you uh, work with layers very often? For professional work, I do. Um, I don't really for personal work, honestly, because it's a little bit cumbersome. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it can get in the way of like the creative, you know, part of my personal stuff when I do it is just to like commit, you know, and just stop with the whole like, oh, maybe I want to change it later, you know, that's yeah. the drive myself crazy with that. So I just try to like, be more purposeful. Um, so I don't really feel the need for layers other than like, to control something, but I'll use um uh, morph target for that. Okay. Yeah. Morph targets I use quite a bit. I, I'm a big fan of Big, big fan of morph targets. Definitely. I think it's just the, like you're saying, the control. Being able to, to dial it in maybe a little heavier than you want or more. Yeah, exactly. That's what I like to do. Heavier in the beginning and then knock it back. For sure. I didn't know that GDC is going to be free to attend this year online. Cool. Cool. That's good. Yeah, that was one of the last year. That was one of we were planning to do a Noma does a party there every year. Uh, mm-hmm. with the co sponsored with Art Station. And that was the first event that got shut down. Oh. Nice. So that was when uh, everybody started pulling out of like Facebook and Unity and Station. Yeah. Like, oh, no, this is a weird time. <laughs> But yeah, that's awesome. They have it online and free. Do you ever go to many of the big events or shows? Um, 
I went to uh, that art station party the year before, I think. Oh, huh. uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, GDC, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we did a hiring event there. And then uh, my friend uh, AJ got me into the party. Nice. With long That's lines. Cool. Yeah, he let, he like got me in uh like a VIP thing or whatever with some drink tickets and stuff. That's where I met Chris Costa. It was cool. A lot of a lot of good people there that I like knew online but not in real life. Yeah, that's such a weird thing is meeting people online, even interacting with them online, but like we're in this age of, you know, sometimes you just know their work or maybe you know their name. But it's such a it's a, kind of a surreal thing sometimes when you can meet people in person. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, super surreal. Pretty good. Kind of like. Yeah, nice. Oh, hello. So I'm like going over with a couple other passes that are like super sharp. From a distance, it works pretty good. Up close, it's not amazing, but that's okay. No, oh, that's looking good. Using it in inverse though too, like on some of the skin texture. Yeah. Totally. Nice. Hmm. Not that I feel like I'm super ready for those yet, but sometimes I'll put them in there as like a morph target. Or um I don't know, when you get into sculpting pores and stuff, sometimes I'll just lay down like a base level of pour. And then I go yeah. back and just sculpt on it to like break it up or to add to kind of pick out the details or things that really stuck out, I guess. And like mm-hmm. rather than just like stamping alphas on top. I also like to just put a little texture on it sometimes because like this like super clean yeah. highlight. Like it it's just feels so CG. It feels no, so fake that I just want to put something on there to just break that up. Yes. Maybe I'll get into some of my skin stuff too real quick. Do you do you have like a whole selection of uh, pores and stuff like that? I just have a couple brushes that I'll that I'll use. Oh cool. Um so let's see, we'll do some skin surface and then fine lines. That'll probably be a good fine line brush probably. Uh, Tom from YouTube is asking, can you apply to Nomen if your main 3D environment is in Blender? Yes, you can. Uh, if you want to chat with any of our admissions advisors, uh, that's probably the best way to actually progress. So uh, you can either, hopefully we'll have a contact card here in the chat soon uh, that you can fill out and speak to admissions. Otherwise, you can just go to our website and uh, find the speak to admissions portal there. Uh, they actually, we work differently for than most uh, colleges and schools for portfolio applications. Uh, you don't just submit and never hear anything. Uh, the process is that you actually submit, work with an applications or admissions advisor uh, until you you are ready to apply. So you basically, you know, they will work with you back and forth to say, here's what you should add to your portfolio. Here's what you should remove. Here's things you should work on. Uh, so if you're interested, the, honestly, the best way is just speak to admissions and uh, they can help you out. Um, question from Twitch. How many vertices or faces are on your model? Like what's your poly count right now? I don't know. Uh, and that's a question I get a lot and it doesn't matter. Yeah. That's, that's the best you, answer guess. actually is it doesn't really matter. Mine is about, yeah. they asked what mine is as well. Uh, mine is kind of up here, but it's 1.46 million. Yeah. Mine's uh, 1.6 million. Yeah, so not a ton. I think we both started from the same base mesh, which was the the starting yeah. uh, head, of the default planes of the head. And so we're kind of just working it up. Went through Z, Z real mesh, got some nicer topology, and um, now we're 
kind of nearing the end. We got about a half, twenty minutes left. Yeah, Just kind of dial these in. Here's a question for you. When you're working on a, a project, how do you know when you're done? You're never done. You're never done. But if it's a personal uh, yeah. project, how do you know when you're done? Um, it's a good question. I mean, that, I mean, honestly, it's so cliche, but like that saying that art's never finished, only abandoned is, is mm. 100%. I mean, you, you could go forever. Uh, so you have to add artificial limitations on yourself. So I would say when I'm happy with it, um, enough and then you just feel you're ready to move on. I mean, it depends on what you're doing. It's sometimes like you have a goal and you, and you hit that goal. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you can think like, Oh, I'm not super happy, but I'll do better next time. Right. So it just, uh, you know, it depends, but yeah, it, it's a skill in itself is to move on, uh, and to know when you're done. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, you have to kind of answer it yourself, but uh, I think it's important to know that you have to add limitations on yourself Absolutely. because it, you, you can just go forever. Absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of one of those things if you just have to. It's a kind of self evaluation. I think you, you got to know what also what your goal is. You know, are yeah. you trying to make a really final piece where you know, somebody can pour over the image or the model for for a long time? Or is this just an image and is it a study? Like kind of what's your goal there? Yeah. Is, uh, is that... Like we're going to be done with this in 15 minutes. Right. Yeah, exactly. I'll be done. Uh, although I, I might I might do something tonight. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I might want to work on it more. But as far as like even for right now, it's like, okay, we got 15 minutes left. What do I need to do to feel like I'm going to, you know, feel good about this for, for the time that we spent? Yeah, on. for the time being. For exactly. three hours. Okay. I feel I need to, for me, I'm, you know, getting a little bumps on his head to make it look like he's got a shaved head. Just so that looks more complete. You know, I'm trying to get some kind of final levels of detail and that everything as a whole looks somewhat completed. Like that's, it's kind of all dependent. And that really informs it. If you, if you're really clear about your goals, mm -hmm. That will inform it. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't make this model this way if I was doing it for some other reason, you know. But because I know, uh, I'm just limiting myself to a day. Then I'm, I'm doing things different. So it informs the decision. So I, I think it's a, a good tip. One that sounds simple, but it's often overlooked is to be really, really, really specific with your goal early on, and mm -hmm. then it informs everything. So you just got to know why you're doing stuff. Why are you doing stuff? Uh, Noman question. Uh, can you transfer credits from another school to Noman? Uh, only if you are transferring into our BFA degree. And if you are very likely, uh, mostly, most of the time, it's just the general education classes. Uh, some of our core fundamental classes like or 3D classes like Intro to Maya, there's a chance you might be able to, to transfer out of those. But we honestly recommend that you don't because uh, I can tell you from my experience, uh, having known 3D before coming to Noman, that I learned more in the first term than I did at my entire three years of school uh, or four years of school. It was a three or four year school. So, yes and no, depending on what you're asked, what specific courses you're asking about. All right. Pretty good. I want to put some. He's got these really deep uh, wrinkle lines on his neck that I like quite a bit. Yeah, do it. Let's get a little more in here. Do it. Maybe also. Oh, I love those next the the tension like next lines you have in his neck. Those are great. Some old old dude neck, you know? Yeah. These are some of my favorite. Like I just like I, I realized like that there was kind of phases in my career in life where like I like certain things more, you know? Uh -huh. And it, like when I was younger, 
it was like I was sculpting, especially learning anatomy, like sculpting a lot of bodybuilders. Like that was like the thing yeah. to do, like muscly superheroes yeah. and bodybuilders. And now Still it's like, and now it's like I like sculpting like wrinkles and like old people and not like the normal, you know, yeah. or, or like expressions that, that are interesting or stuff like that. I think that's like what you're doing now is not what I think the average person would go to sculpt. It's something where you're like, you've kind of gone through some of those base intro layers like, all right, I want to try something a little different. I want to try something that I haven't seen before. Cool. Yeah, I think that's the natural progression. I think that that sounds exactly like my experience. Um, let's see. I'm not really feeling the fiber mess much, Daesh, but... Mm. Mm. It's not working mm. for you? It would take a lot of time. Let's see... Um... Would you do that in action if you were going to do it like full on for a project or something? Yeah, for a project, yeah, I would I would do an action because then you can just do a couple curves and then all of the clumping and noise would be procedural. Mm. So it would just be more straightforward. The, in fiber mesh, I have to control every hair. Right. So it's just time time consuming. And and it's um destructive. Right. It's like linear and and uh action is nonlinear, which is the best. Uh, eh? Oh, okay. That's low. <laughs> <laughs> Quite low. <laughs> Quite low. Okay. Uh, question, which was, what do you think of Cinema 4D? Do you recommend other programs than this one? Uh, I think if you're getting into motion graphics, there's a lot of people using Cinema 4D. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you want to be in production in a game or movie, I would definitely recommend Maya personally. Do you have a, any other opinions on that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I can definitely vouch for ZBrush and like what you said about movies and games. Like the mm -hmm. program that we're using now is ZBrush and there's really no alternative to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, motion graphics, uh, Cinema 4D is popular. I did use it a long time ago, but I'm sure it's very different now. Mm-hmm. But depends on what you're doing. If you learned modeling and and like you were saying earlier, if you learned modeling in any of these, you could probably translate that to mm. learning some, you know, box modeling, sub D modeling, UV mapping, that kind of stuff. Um, but when it comes to like uh, organic modeling and sculpting for creatures and characters and stuff, uh, what we're doing is kind of what you do. Yeah. I always uh, sometimes I have to look at the thumbnails or the the stream afterwards, and I always see that I'm like deeply, aggressively staring into the screen. Like that, my I don't know if you have friends or coworkers who have like a work face. Like oh yeah, I, I just was thinking of that myself because I, <laughs> I was like oh yeah I guess I'm on here huh and I was just like my mouth is open I was just like oh. yeah yeah yeah. yeah. But I Definitely. mean hey. We used to take like photos of people, you know, and just like their work faces, like when they're clearly like deep in the zone on a project. Yeah. Best. yeah. Uh, is the bachelor's degree available for online students uh, or for online studies? Currently, yes, but that's only due to go to COVID. All of our classes and programs are available online right now. Uh, but when we go back to campus, when the campus is opened, it will only be available uh, in person. So mm -hmm. if you wanted to get started on it now, you could. You could get some of those GEs and kind of intro level classes out of the way. Um, but then when campus reopens, you can, well, we can all go back to our campus, which I'm looking forward to. Probably, yeah, probably yeah, like yeah. you going back to work at some point. Or are you enjoying working? Uh, I like cool. working from home, uh, especially with the, the newborn. You know, yeah. 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 And, and I like my setup, I like my office. So. My computer is actually probably better than my work computer. Mm -hmm. And we were talking uh, uh, before. Uh, I have an eight-month-old, and I think you have a six, some a young, yeah, young one. Six. And uh, I think we both probably have similar experiences where we get to spend more time with them. Like that's definitely been mm -hmm. a huge silver lining for me with with the pandemic. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, I feel very fortunate. A that we are able to work and then be during this time because yeah. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, I mean, I'm here with my wife. We're we're in our home. We have our kid and we're taking care of her. And she's the priority anyways. So it's actually better in some ways, even though it can be work. Um, yeah, it's just like she's there. We're seeing her develop and, you know, why not? She's the priority anyway. So it seems, seems good. And I've heard that from other people. It depends on the age of the kids, but. True. But yeah, this, um, we're really fortunate in that way. Absolutely. Uh, somebody's saying they've worked from worked for three studios from home, and they st they want the studio vibe. There's definitely something to the studio vibe, though. You know, being around a bunch of creative yeah. people is something I do miss in person. There's like that creative spark that can be hard to to replicate yeah. over you know <laughs> Zoom or anything like that. Yeah, that's true. Uh, somebody's asking, we got about eight minutes left, so it might be a good point for you to kind of chime in and show where you can show your stuff. They were asking where they can see your, uh, the Kobe work that you did. Uh, they don't sure. know any artists who are basketball fans. Oh yeah, man. Ball is life. Ball is life, bro. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, save this. Uh, is this private? Yeah, so we could go to um, my Instagram. So my my stuff is art of Jay Hill everywhere. So there's my Kobe thing. Oh, great. You're trying to incognito, yeah. <laughs> it makes you <laughs> it makes you log in. Great. Uh, all right, one second. Uh, do another tab. The art of Jay Hill on Instagram. Mm-hmm. All right, so yeah, so Art of J Hill on Instagram, <clears throat> and then Art of J Hill on YouTube. That's where I've been posting a lot of stuff recently and trying to like show people more of the process. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can check out that if you want. Um, especially if you're into this stuff, you know, I make videos similar to this. Um, there's the Kobe thing, and then I break down some stuff. Uh, talk about kind of the stuff we're talking about right here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's my, that's my stuff online. So YouTube and Instagram. Awesome. Also have a discord. Oh, you do. Do you have your, your own or just like, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So if you want to talk to other people and get some feedback and stuff, I'm trying to, help form a little helpful community over there. So far, so good. It's pretty cool. I like it. I was like, definitely an old, you know, definitely a boomer moment. I was like, when I had my online course for a while, we were doing the Facebook group thing. Yeah. And I don't really ever use Facebook, um, but that's what we're using. And then I had several students be like, is there a Discord? And I'm like, what? Why? What, what is, is that? What? Yeah. Like, how is this better than Skype, guys? doesn't make sense. <laughs> And then now that I'm in there, I'm like, oh, actually at work, we use Slack and um, it's like a, it's like a, mm -hmm. you know, pretty comparable to Slack and it's free. So it's pretty good. And you can do all kinds of custom stuff. So anyways, we've got that too. Awesome. Is there a place that they can find a link to your Discord or just kind of search it or? Yeah. Um, that is a good question. Where did I put it? Um, if you go to uh, my YouTube, there's some links there. Also, um, um, oh, maybe it's not on my site. I should put it on my site. But yeah, you can go to my my YouTube. Uh, it's right here. And then um, maybe I'll put it on my... Oh, it's also on my Instagram. If you go to the bio, there's mm -hmm. the... Um, the multiple links there, you can go there. So maybe I'll put a button up for, on my website or something for it or on my highlights. But yeah, that's where you can go for that. Perfect. All righty. I think I'm pretty close to, I mean, I could probably noodle on this thing forever. Dude, I can noodle on this literally for months. Yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of doing problem. little details and I'm, I'm trying right, to stop dude. myself from not going in too much further with things. Yeah, dude. Looks good. Nice. I like the, the skin detail. It's definitely a little heavy. Like this is 
pretty aggressive, but I think it works at, at like this distance. It works fine, like to kind of communicate those mm-hmm. shapes. No, for sure. And it gives me, maybe because we were talking about it, but it gives me a little bit of the Dishonored vibes. Yeah, yeah. They had a very interesting, yeah. I, like, I just love their, their style and their texture. I think yeah. they did some really beautiful work there. Uh, question, do you ever use poly paint when sculpting or do you just go straight to substance painter when it's time? Yeah, I use poly paint. Uh, I poly painted my cyberpunk girl and uh, the Kobe thing that I did. Hmm. I love and, poly- uh, Yeah, I also poly painted my Steve Jobs portrait too. Nice. I just love not having to leave a software sometimes. Exactly. To like kind of visualize it all yeah. up. Front. But for production work, I would always use some kind of painter. And the reason is because it's, it's non-destructive. Mm-hmm. Uh, poly paint is pretty destructive. They have some tools in there now to do some tweaking, but like in substance painter it's just you know you can go to any layer any color at any time and change stuff um so it's just way better in terms of editing it's a lot it can be a lot more creative that way but when i do personal work it's it can be faster and more direct for me to do it immediately but it just i just can't do revisions that that well it's just very like set in stone i guess you know but it's good for just doing quick stuff to visualize is how I use it. Is I, if I just want to see what it's going to look like, or could look like, or pitch what colors could be, or oh yeah, that's true, sure. It's great for that. But as far as like doing a final production paint job, probably something or texture job, something, some other project or program mm-hmm. could be better. we're both trying to finish this thing as fast as we can <laughs> yeah we're like both super quiet <laughs> like, just gotta focus never done never yep. gonna be done absolutely well unfortunately it is twelve fifty nine, which means we have only one minute left uh but jay i want to say thank you a ton for coming on the stream again and, and sharing all your advice uh if, if you guys want to check out more of jay's work you can check out his instagram or his youtube page um thank you again man it's been this has been a great stream to kind of see your process of everything from reference to blocking out stuff to what you look for so i I really appreciate you being here yeah man thank you for the invite dude it was cool jamming and, and chatting with you absolutely all right everybody well thank you so much for the stream uh we're gonna head out and as we head out we're gonna play our our little video in case you were curious about what Noman's campus looks like if you have any questions uh, about Noman or any of our programs please reach out to our uh, admissions team and they can help you out well thanks again jay and thanks everybody have an awesome uh day and hopefully have a great week see ya